What is going on? It's Alex coming back at you with another video. And today we are in for a treat because all these hours I've been digging into this wide receiver class have finally culminated in a top 55. It's actually, I think, 57 wide receivers for the upcoming 2025 NFL draft. If you are new, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Click that link tree because you get access to all the socials I post on Twitter all the time, including a lot of the All-22 clips that will be related to exactly what I'm talking about today. But, of course, take advantage of those sponsors. What's going to keep me alive during this video? Holy pop. I got that sponsorship because I get discounts for myself. Eh, you can feel free to use it as well. But also, Underdog, great company, great brand. They treat me very well. It's honestly something I didn't realize about sponsors until I've had quite a few. They treat me very well, and honestly, I love their app. I use it myself on Twitter as well. I post when they have a lot of specials. But right now, forever, you're going to be able to get a 50% deposit match up to 250 bucks when you use my code. But you don't even have to go to their website. Just go to the link tree and click that top link. It puts everything in for you. Sends me 60 bucks as well, full transparency, but I don't do it just for the money. They don't force me to promote them. I just love their brand. But let's get right into this because we have a long video to go, to go over. So I already did the top guys and some grades have changed since that video because I did not feel very comfortable after those first evaluations with how far I was away from the consensus. And this is 100% honest opinions. I'm going to piss a lot of people off and that's okay. You know what? I'm more than fine being wrong. I grade the players on who they are right now. And honestly, if somebody ascends and I'll be talking about some guys who I think will be ascending, that to me is an even bigger plus than the guys who just stay near the top or in the middle and just stay there. So uh, stay with me on this. This is going to be a great one. And, you know, this is going to be how I grade the position. It's not only going to be one to 100. It's also going to be tier based based on the role that I think they'll uh, fit into. So tier one, you got those wide receiver ones. That's 80 plus. And I'm pretty tough as a grader. Uh, five is average. Five out of 10. C is adequate. So keep that in mind as well. Now, some I've been a little bit nicer over the next over the past couple of years and, you know, kind of like six out of 10s more so like adequate or average but at the same time that's still a really tough grading scale compared to a lot of other people's or like the nfl scouts use that like one to eight or nine scale it's going to be a little bit more confusing to other people so um, this is going to be a lot easier for me to understand as well as for you but uh tier two 80 to 75 that's going to be the wide receiver two so that's going to be starting starting grades are 75 plus um tier three are those guys who should be getting some reps who i don't really fully think will be uh, full-time elite contributors, and there's going to be a lot of them in this class, and there's a lot of really good players, so stay tuned for that, but those are the flex players who will be getting some reps. Tier four are the developmental guys. Those are guys who need some work, need some time, and um, you know those guys who might be on the practice squad, might be the fifth wide receiver, but you know they'll be getting a rep here, a rep there, but I don't think they'll be a main portion of the offense. How I grade that one to 100 category is through these specific categories. So you know, because the scale actually has to have something besides me pulling a number out of my ass. So hard cut change of directions. Those are your curls. Those are your ins and your outs. Pretty much the stuff that you really have to dig your feet in. Also, comebacks are included in there. 45 degree change of direction. Those are your posts, your slants, your corners. You guys know the deal. So uh, basically, I wanted to split it up because some guys are just really smooth with their slant routes, but they just cannot run an in or an out route to save their life. There's a lot of them, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I wanted to do that because it's a lot easier to split it up into those two to be able to give you a better picture of the type of route runner they are run after the catch ability, self-explanatory. I mean, I don't really take missed tackles forced into account as much as maybe some say I should, because I think that college defenders are not translatable to the NFL. For the most part, there's not many guys who play in college who will be starting in the NFL. So I look at the actual ability they have. Do they make guys miss by uh, being extremely elusive? Can they hit the brace and make guys miss in a phone booth type of thing? There's a lot to it. Um, separation. It's kind of a culmination of speed, but also physicality. There's a lot of receivers who might not be able to separate with their speed or route running, but they know how to use their weight as leverage and they can generate separation without having those mainstay traits. So for me, it's a great way of implementing a physical aspect to the game where also because slimmer wide receivers can use their route running and speed, it's kind of an equal playing field for all the receivers. So it doesn't lean too much one side or another. Uh, hands pretty much comes down to drops. Drop percentage usually is key. 
Like you'll see if guys don't have good hands, they'll start juggling the ball and all that stuff. And usually the guys who juggle the ball, when they get popped, they don't catch it. So uh, drop percentage is pretty indicative of that. Release package, a little bit more intricate. This is one of the more fine details of the game. And this is where I see actually a really high percentage translation to the NFL. The guys who have really elite footwork, timing, and spacing are the ones who usually can survive. And, um, you know, whether that's going to be using your upper body to get past a press defenders down the field or just simply being able to get yourself in position in time. You guys know what release packages are. I ended up really over the past year trying to develop my understanding of release packages. There's a lot of wide receiver coaches out there on the internet who are teaching proper release packages and what guys should be doing. So uh, it's easy for you guys to understand that as well if you really want to put in the work. Uh, but speed, a lot of it's play speed. It's not necessarily going to be a pure 40 time. There's one guy where he's quoted as going 24 miles per hour. Um, the speed matched up on tape, but still something that I definitely like to put in there. Uh, burst, that's the acceleration portion. Like this applies for run after the catch ability, but it also applies for routes. Do you explode out of your breaks? Do you explode off the line? Like those are two factors that really matter. So that's key there versus the press. This is something that not many receivers can handle very well. Even big receivers, if a guy is sticky to you, which they are going to be in the NFL, are you still able to generate separation? Are you still able to get proper positioning? Are you still able to catch with uh, contact? And to me, that matters a lot. Even though it's only 5% of my overall grading, it still matters a lot. Contested catching, um, relatively down to a percentage. There's some unbelievable contested catchers in this class, so stay tuned for that. And then blocking. I call that the Romo Dunze special because I realized that, you know, even though it's 5%, it's still... It matters. Some guys really can set themselves apart by being a good blocker. Some guys are going to limit their role because they cannot be in on rundowns. But that's a very long winded way of saying this is how we get the grades. And it factor is plus or minus five. You could thank Dylan Gabriel for being sub six foot for having it boost up to that tier. Uh, I know he's a quarterback, not a wide receiver. But, you know, there's certain guys where I really did feel like plus or minus three just did not capture the lack of greatness. Uh, for most of them, or like a really key factor that I think could severely hamper them. But nobody has a plus or minus five in this. Spoiler alert. But let's get right into this. Let's have fun. Starting out with the one guy who, I mean, there's a couple other guys like Mumpfield and um, Brazel or Brazel the second. Like there's just guys who I don't really have uh, tape on. Those are the only two that didn't have tape. But there's also guys who had early season injuries. Antoine Juice Wells. Like there was not really very much translatable tape before he ended up hurting himself and being out for the year. So wanted to give him a shout out. He's really, really good after the catch. Um, his blocking is not an F. I just forgot to delete that. Lamau. Uh, but he's honestly someone who's really fun to watch. I'm excited for him to really show out at Ole Miss, especially since Zagari Franklin is going to be gone. So it's going to be a little bit more room for him to step up as someone who already has had off seasons with their whole entire system. They're super excited for him to bounce back. But I told you it's 57, uh, technically 57, including Juice Wells. I could have included all the other guys who I didn't mention who had early season injuries or those two guys who didn't have tape, but, um, you know, I didn't want to factor that in to your analysis. I will be continuing what I did with all of my other analyses and reading you a game that I watched for, uh, for each player. And it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be long, but it's going to be informative. And I think that matters. I don't write these notes for you guys to be able to get a some like a summarized or summarized version of what I saw. Uh, I do it so that you can watch uh, walk through a game with me. I write ugh, English is tough. We're already starting off early today. English is very tough, but I write these notes as a way to remind myself to relive an experience, rewatch a game through my takeaways. So this is more for me, but you guys really like it. And so I'm doing it for you as well. So keep that in mind. Um, some of these guys really don't have any notes on them because of the fact that they're just, I hate to say it, freaking boring. And that happens, but uh, we're still going to be reading some notes for all of them. JJ Jones is my first guy. Really solid frame, 6'2", 210. I mean, you look at it and you're just like, oh my goodness. And some people, like I've had some comments saying like, dude, you should never have Fs in here. Like these receivers aren't that bad. And this is on an NFL scale. Okay, so C is adequate, so it is a really tough scale, and I think that only the best of the best deserve credit. Call me a pessimist, but I think that every single year we will not have 56 guys who will get reps in the NFL, let alone starters. So um, being a little bit more critical of the lower end guys 
is much more applicable to reality as much as I want to be an optimist. But let's continue on here. JJ Jones to me is essentially going to be a deep threat. <laughs> like we're just going to leave it there. But here are my notes from his Clemson game. Uh, he did not handle press well, did not get separation, and he ended up missing on uh, a low ball. So he wasn't able to go down and catch it. Also, his, his drop percentage is pretty damn high. If you see a hands grade of F, it's definitely above 10% drop rate. So also keep that in mind. If it's at 10%, I give it a five out of 10. And then below that, it is going to be an F grade because I just think that below that grade is just unacceptable. You guys might say, oh, but you love Johnny Wilson. He had an F grade in hands. So keep that in mind. Um, so continuing on, I said press is ending. Uh, he get, got jammed the F out of uh, when he was versus press. So it pretty much was every corner that was on him got the best of him. Uh, he has a solid top speed. He tries so hard to be physical, yet fails. Uh, I'm not going to read this last line because it gets a little personal, but essentially I was just saying he's very, very, very boring. I just don't really think he translates to the NFL very well. That being said, there's a lot of room to improve. And for players who do get these years in college, they end up having those off seasons where now you don't have Drake May. Now you have to really emphasize the best version of yourself. And I think JJ Jones could. And he's one of the few UNC receivers that ended up lasting through the whole year. So um, I love that about him as well. But continuing on, let's not focus too much on these lower end guys. Josh Kelly is next. I know a lot of people like Josh Kelly. Uh, he flashed out to me last year during the Washington State game where I think he had three touchdowns over 100 yards and he did a really good job there. And his hands grade supports that. I mean, he is a reliable catcher. But this is, these are my notes of him versus Washington. So he transferred from Washington to Texas Tech, as you guys can see. Uh, he's not very explosive, but he can use physicality. Fortunately, it wasn't enough. Ended up being zero separation. Uh, and again, separation can be from physicality. Like tight ends generate separation either by being smart, by being efficient as a route runner, or by just being a beast and using your physicality. Uh, even though he was using physicality, he still did not gain separation. Uh, there was a whole bunch of wasted movement with hesitation steps. And he does not end up running sharp routes with them since his routes are all over the place. Something I did see is he kind of drifts and he doesn't really run a very refined route pattern. Um, he's also a six year senior. Keep that in mind. I said, I'm sorry, I cannot imagine an NFL roster wanting this guy uh, while he's a six year and still playing like this. Um, I ended up actually ending this specific game early because of how much I just genuinely did not see a translation and like we're at this point this is the boring part of the video you guys are excited for the exciting parts but i think that discussing the low end allows us to appreciate the high end more like these top 10 receiver videos we love them right we do but at the same time there's we lack appreciation and we kind of get numb because we hear all this glowing praise about every single player sometimes it's good to kind of highlight the negatives. Also, don't take dream factors or dream fits into too much consideration. They're there for fun more than anything. Adds a cool little aspect to the graphic. And with 56 guys or 57, did hold up. Oh, it is 57. I just forgot. Hey, there's the stereotypical Alex, uh, Alex mess up on the graphic there. But you know, with 57 guys, there's going to be a lot of overlap. Okay. Just keep that in mind. I also used all 32 teams because every team can use a receiver, but this is a guy who I was really bummed out about because I was really excited for Julian Fleming, like really excited. And he's somebody that at Ohio State, I actually had a developmental grade on him last year, not this low, but I really just, the whole entire Ohio State offense for the most part, minus Maserati Marv, pretty much let me down last year and Donovan Jackson, keep that in mind. Um, you guys know my love for Donovan Jackson, but this is my notes for Julian Fleming during Notre Dame. He did transfer to uh, Penn State, which I have no idea why you would do that. Like he's also not a spring chicken, but, uh, continuing on Notre Dame game. Uh, he literally ran into a defender during his route. Like he just straight up ran right into him like mid route. Uh, that's something I really do not like at all. Like you have to, you know, get open, not purposely try to get close. And it wasn't him trying to gain separation through physicality. Like the dude just straight up ran into a defender. Like you gotta have some field awareness there. Um, he got effed by press. I am using abbreviations here. Uh, basically he gets 
zero separation and he gets dominated. He's not going to be able to gain separation. And my next line was he any honestly got zero separation. He's like, I said, I don't know if he left uh, Ohio State or Ohio State kicked him out because he's just far from acceptable quality. I've never seen a receiver get zero separation like this and he cannot break tackles. Um, the one nice thing is he does have like some upper body release package and he also can use some inside outside releases and some a little bit of burst to get some separation. But overall, it was honestly just a little bit more unacceptable. It's not something the NFL is going to be going for. It's how many great receiver classes we've had. I mean, what do you expect? <laughs> you know, like we've uh, we've been spoiled and you're not going to get 55 guys on a roster. We might not even get 30 and you know, that sucks, but it is what it is. Let's continue on though. We got another 54 dudes to talk about. Next is Will Shepard. This is a dude who I was very excited to watch because there was a lot of hype around him, but this dude has like a 16% drop rate. I'm like, brother, get on the jugs machine. Stop being Quentin Johnston here, right? So um, he is a little bit bigger, 6'3", 205. I, this is my notes versus Georgia. I think it's a pretty translatable game, um, but I, do, I really want to love Will Shepard. I'll, I'll say that I really do want to love Will Shepard. I just don't, <laughs> but um, he's twitchy for his size. He does not have a, he does not have a quick break. He has some nice slants and he developed his route into a go. Basically I look for route manipulation when guys end up getting screwed up on their route or it's play just isn't going oh, the way that you're supposed to be going. Like the rhythm's just not there. I E maybe the quarterback gets pressured early and starts to scramble. And basically the play is not going the way it's designed to. Uh, I love seeing receivers end up developing the route, which at the start of this game, he did so. Um, so he gets to his top speed very quickly, but um, he ends up having to take a charge step off the line. You'll see it. Like the ball will snap in for half a second. And he's like, and then goes, I'm like, come on, dude, like get off the line. Um, also ended up noting that there was some other dude at number 85 who is very twitchy. So pretty cool about that. Uh, I said he has a nice use of a slight push off to gain separation, uh, but but he ended up dropping a very easy to catch ball. Um, he had the solid outside release. He just does not have the top speed to get any form of separation. He had a nice catch in traffic on a crosser uh, with Starks, uh, Malachi Starks being tight on him. Uh, he stopped using physicality. And then his separation just completely disappeared. Not like he really had it anyways. And he got clamped by stronger defenders. So basically he ended up like taking advantage of defenders who did not want to use any form of physicality against him. He has some good juice off the line, but you know, the bottom line is he, the NFL is very physical and he couldn't handle it. And that's okay. I mean, for college, he's going to be a very effective receiver because there's a lot of off coverage in college. There's a lot of off zone and that's where he seemed to thrive. Right. And, you know, doing some physicality on a curl route, certainly something that could be translatable, but that's unbelievably role specific. And at 6'3", 205, I would really have wanted his hands to be more of an asset. Uh, he had that one good catch in traffic, like I talked about, but bottom line was very, very unimpressed. Uh, Elijah Badger's a fun one. So this dude was pretty much a screen and bubble machine who can take a ball to a house, to the house, just because of his vision. Uh, and he's also really tough to break, to bring down, but his hands grade was really, really good. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it got up, he got pretty damn low percentage. It might've been 3% this past year, but over his career, I think it was like 5.7. And that's just because he was taking a lot of screen passes. So I ended up going more with the career drop percentage rather than um, the past year, especially looking at how he was used versus Oregon. You'll see Oregon, Bama, Georgia, Texas, Michigan. Those are the teams that I really, Notre Dame. Those are the teams that I usually like to select for, uh, for talking about because it's kind of key to be able to know how they play against NFL talent if you're going to the NFL. Uh, so he ended up transferring. Um, oh, he's not even at freaking Arizona State anymore. He's at Florida. My bad. I, I could change the graphic, but who gives a shit? Um, he transferred to Florida. He had a season ending back injury. So RIP did that. Could have dropped him more. Decided not to. It's so low as it is. Who cares? But I digress. Um, he is he's a, he has a flash of vision and he has good run after the catch, like I already described. He's a long strider. He's not very explosive. So basically, he's somebody where you'll see him just going those long strides rather than the really quick feet why he has like pretty much no acceleration, but he can get up to a top speed. 
Um, he is, doesn't have very great change of direction. He has been used as a running back on certain reps. He has very good contact balance. He's primarily a screen guy. He is a crap blocker. I remember this. Um, one of the other receivers was taking a screen and then he ended up uh, basically just whiffing on a block and ended up being a tackle for loss in this game. Um, he had a mid ass in route, basically just didn't run the route very well. Uh, runs it slow. Timing's just not there. Not going to gain separation versus tight defenders. Uh, he does round his outs. So something I do like to look for is if a guy can sink their hips or at least maintain momentum through their ins and out routes. Like when you bend your route, you're simply just allowing the defender to have more time to adjust to the change of direction. Because if you think about it, if you're going up like this, the defender has no indication that you're changing direction. But if you're starting to go like this, you have all that time. Sure, you're maintaining momentum, but the defender himself is not going to think you're going on a streak. He's going to start slowing down his break to then come down on you. Pause. So regardless, that's something that I will be talking about for a lot of these guys. Rounded in routes, rounded out routes, and that could just be a college thing. But I've seen a pretty high translation to the NFL of the guys who know how to sink their hips. They don't need to run those rounded outs. They don't need to run those rounded ins. They can really focus on breaking hard and then cutting smoothly. So uh, keep that in mind. So he has a poorly executed double move. Remember that like it's very rare to see a double move genuinely be executed horribly. The defender just knew right away. Like there, it was no fooling him. It's pretty much like a fat dude with a beard. It's like you're not fooling anybody or like a bald dude with a hat. Not fooling anybody. But uh, continuing on, he ended up being hurt for the rest of the season. He looked like a run after the catch guy, and that's pretty much it. He ended up taking um, a screen route and basically reversed it across field. It was beautiful, but um, like that was kind of the big highlight is the fact that he's just a run after the catch guy, and certain teams could use that. But at the same time, I really didn't see him as a receiver doing very much. And I, I think there's certain systems that could leverage that properly. Nick Anderson is next. Uh, he was touted as like a top 100 player coming into the year. And I actually really like what he has in terms of upside. But uh, let's get into my notes about him versus Texas. So uh, he did not start, but at his size, it is very good to see him versus physical corners. Uh, he is not overly athletic, but he's a willing and able blocker. He had a nice curl route, but he also doesn't really reach his top speed when doing so. He had nice positioning through upper body releases, hence why he has a B in release. Uh, he just looks like he's running in quicksand. That's something I did know. Like the dude looks like he's running hard, but he's not really getting anywhere. Uh, and that's okay because at 6'4", 213, he has some really good traits. <laughs> the fact that he has a pretty shit drop rate is not great, but um, he had an ass double move in the red zone, but he did end up scoring a touchdown this game. Overall, you know, you really do wish for someone who has that frame to be able, like if you have a really good release package, especially at that size, you get in proper position. You don't need great separation because if you're a great contested catch threat with in a polished uh, release package, you're already in the best spot for the quarterback besides having a ton of separation. He doesn't have that. Um, he, usually if a contested catch is in the F range, it is the uh, sub 40% over his career. So that sucks, but Nick Anderson easily can improve those two stats and become a very, very viable weapon because I do definitely see that he has upside. Hence why I gave him that plus one on the it factor. Kobe Prentice is next. I was like, I love Bama receivers. That's just me. I'm a sucker for Bama. And I mean, I'll just spoil my last line. He's the worst Bama receiver I've ever studied. Leave it there. But uh, well, let's talk about my notes of him versus Michigan. So he does not handle press well. He does miniature 45 degree cuts. And that's pretty much how he ends up getting his ins and out routes. He like goes like, tss, tss, and it's like, you know, like actually learn how to run those routes. He doesn't maintain momentum really well through it. Um, it doesn't really work. So those 45 degree cuts, they've worked for some people in the past. I don't even remember who, but I have like noted micro 45 degree cuts for 90s, basically doing a double cut for a 90 degree cut. Um, and it's worked for some, but uh, it does not work for Kobe Prentice. Uh, there's a crazy gap between Bond and him as well as Jalen Hale. Love that dude. Uh, I would love to study him more, but the sad fact is that, you know, 
he ended up hurting himself early on. I'm actually quite surprised. Oh, I think that's why he didn't have enough translatable reps. There wasn't like a game where he had more than 10 reps. Otherwise, I'd be putting Jalen Hill on here because I think that dude's a monster. I digress. Um, Jalen Hill is the one who's stealing the spotlight as the low rep guy, not Kobe Prentice. Um, he's extremely underwhelming. And I said, it is sad because I wanted to, him to be special. He even failed to adjust to a low ball, worst Bama receiver I've ever studied. So um, just more of a letdown than anything, because I really want some excitement when it comes to Kobe, but he's reliable. You know, if you throw him the ball, he's probably going to catch it apart from if he has to do it in a contested situation, which at 5'10", 182, what are you doing if you're giving a, a guy like that a contested ball? So uh, we'll see what happens with Kobe. But, you know, again, not every single player can be an NFL star. And that's just a sad truth. When you do these lists that are 50 plus, even 30 plus, you're getting guys who will never be on a roster. But this also might apply to the XFL. This might apply to the CFL if you guys are fans of that as well. But Demir Miller, this dude is fun. Uh, he went to Monmouth and transferred to Rutgers. Those are two schools I really, really like. He had a 7.5 yards after or running after the catch average. That's pretty crazy too. So I was excited to see him versus FAU because they have some good players there. Um, so I said he's not great at blocking, but he's willing to. He's just there's a just a shit ton of runs to start the game. So it's a very run heavy offense. He dropped a catch in traffic. Uh, he does not have very sh uh, sharp routes that he runs. I'm not seeing the missed tackle force ability, but he does have solid vision. A very simplistic offense overall. He dropped a low ball. It's weird to see him dropping balls with a sub 4% drop rate. He ended up only being credited for, I think, one drop that game, by the way, as well. So it's interesting to see him like drop two, but I digress. Uh, his top speed's capped a bit, and it was shown on a double move. He had some flash... Um, he had some flash of acceleration downfield, but he ended up having a swim release as well. So that's at least why he got an adequate in the release category. He had a nice route fake on an out route, on a quick out route. Would like to, uh, I said, would like more post route manipulation for him to get open. Kind of just runs the route that he's assigned rather than running the route that will actually get him open. Uh, most targets are just short curls in soft spots, just not enough explosiveness to get open versus NFL corners. Uh, really bad at generation generating separation in man. Oh my lord, this guy cannot do shit versus press. What happened to that downfield swim that I saw on that double move? Uh, he ended up having a couple catch and traffics, which was nice. He did a nice dip on his shoulder to evade a hand strike when he was doing a fade. So basically, he tried to get jammed. Someone tried to jam him, and he ended up manipulating his shoulder to be able to, you know, miss the punches. So that was at least a plus there. That's why he didn't get a D or lower in release. He had two good shows of release package, and that's good enough for me to know that at least you have the foundation for it. Um, so genuinely so let down, I want him to be my diamond, and he just was not it. The bottom line is I just did not see him generating separation at a translatable level because on the routes that he did, he was pretty much just sitting in soft spots, which cool, glad, but he also on his routes that he would gain separation on, he wasn't approaching it with the speed and acceleration required versus more athletic defensive backs to really get open. I think it'll be a really solid weapon for Rutgers that yards after catch will translate, but you know, that vision is key and we'll see if a team that can use somebody who has that vision, maybe you could be more of a gadget role. Um, we'll be able to maximize his talent. Zagari Franklin is next. He just transferred to Illinois as of June 16th. So he actually was my last edit because I realized I already had him as Ole Miss and he trans he transferred. So he transferred twice. Then he was UTSA before that, San Antonio, and then he transferred to Ole Miss, and now he's transferring to Illinois. So interesting group of players that they have there at Illinois. But um, I have just some really short notes because he's kind of underwhelming. Versus Alabama, he gains no vertical separation. He flashed a little bit of deep speed, but there's not much more beyond his double move here and there. That's pretty much it. Like he has solid hands, um, you know, somebody at 6'1", 190, he ended up gaining five pounds, which is cool, but he was 185, just didn't really have the physical stature versus those larger Bama corners that are NFL starting corners. Um, I just didn't really see it apart from him to be able to generate that deep speed on deep specific routes. And I didn't see him generate anything with his overall route running. So Zakari Franklin, um, someone who I was really excited for last year just did not end up 
making the cut. Theo Weiss is next. This is a dude who I was like super hyping up because he was the guy who I wanted to be my draft diamond. I saw his drop percentage is somewhere, I think in the low three or like the mid twos. And it's like, that's great. And, you know, I love Missouri players. I'm a sucker for Missouri guys. And this just wasn't it. So let's look at my notes of him versus the Ohio State University. He is also sub 200 pounds. Keep that in mind. So he has a slow get off. I said, bro is slow. What the hell? Um, we are 37 plays in and bro has yet to have one good rep. Uh, finally had one good corner route with a swim move. So there you go. Uh, basically a swim is like a swim release in the upper body. Maybe a guy's trying to jam you you like slap their hands down. You go over and you basically get open. It's great for positioning. It's super key. Uh, it's why I actually love Jahan Dotson. He did it constantly. Uh, Davidson and Benison ended up shutting him down. He has some flashes of speed, but there's so few and far between. I get excited when he has a good rep and then realize it's one of his very few versus Jordan Hancock. If you guys know anything, I absolutely do not believe in Jordan Hancock to be an NFL player. So um, Theo Weiss overall, like he pretty much is somebody who is a reliable catcher. That's not very valuable in the NFL because there's a lot of reliable catchers. If you're not reliable, you're probably not on a team. So hopefully Theo Weiss can get a little bit more explosive at sub 200 pounds. I was shocked. I really was. It just was uninspiring. And this is a guy who I came in thinking I was going to have this guy as like a top five dude. Like you look at the stats and you're just like, damn, reliable catcher. He has a great height to him. He's like thin enough to where he probably is a good athlete and you missed out on the last portion and doesn't really seem to work. So uh, very unfortunate there, but I really do hope that Theo Weiss proves me wrong. I always hope that for all my players. If you see top 250, by the way, by, uh, as well, by the way, uh, you know, I'm going to end up putting this in the description because I already know I'm going to get some comments on it. Um, I'm using that as like 250, like two UDFA. Like I just, there's no reason for me just to say UDFA because seventh round, sixth round, there's just some weird shit that happens. So keep that in mind as well. 47, J. Michael Sturdivant. Uh, this is a guy who I have a lot of, I have some good vibes for J. Michael, but my key issue for him last off season was that this dude runs the route that's assigned to him and nothing more. He does not do post route manipulation. Uh, he was the reason why I started really looking at receivers for their playmaking ability and shout out to Alec Eunor, who we'll talk about much later um, for, you know, he's pretty much the antithesis of that. He is a big playmaker, but J. Michael Sturdivant versus Arizona. I love watching wide receivers, especially in the Pac-12 versus, well, it's no longer that way, but as of last year, the Pac-12 versus Arizona. So he had a nice flash of deep speed, would like a quicker break on his comebacks. He kind of drifts into his curl, which is not ideal, especially when you're drifting into the defenders. I wish he used a bit more physicality to dig in and push off and use leverage because um, on his cuts because he is keeping the defender in his hip pocket when he can generate small separation very easily doing so. Nice adjustment to a ball that was thrown off target. He has some nice deep speed, but his feet are not super quick and his release packages are slow and clunky. The ball tracking is kind of non-existent. Overall, I am very underwhelmed. Again, there's a whole entire reason I have this graphic up to where you guys get to see the breakdown because my notes aren't going to explain everything, but it's a way for you guys to kind of in, in a way, watch the game with me. So that's why I do this. But um, Jay Michael is a guy who has a great frame. He's shifting from number one to number seven, which I think is a hell of a big loss for his aura as well, because number one on him looked phenomenal. I have nothing against number seven, but you know, when you're number one and then you lose it, I'm like, my guy, <laughs> like, like and that's like, it's honestly not analysis. It's more satire than anything, but um, bottom line is he's reliable, has some good deep speed. If people are wondering why deep speed being solid is a B, because A pluses are designed for arguably the best of the best. I don't like handing those out. I don't like handing A's or A minuses out. That's a very tough category to get to. B plus is a very good category. So again, keep that in mind. At 46, you got Barry and Brown. Um, you know, for the guys who are part of the last, like the top guys, and Barry and Brown was part of the original top receivers. Uh, I like to keep it short and sweet with them. Um, bottom line is versus Georgia. I actually had some pretty, Georgia and Bama. Like I kind of combined the notes to have actually a takeaway one. Um, he has, he's a solid deep threat with a good motor. He has a hard time versus threat uh, versus press. Bottom line is he's a shittier version of Isaiah Bond. 
That's exactly what I wrote. So, you know, he shouldn't be great versus press. He's sub 180, understandable. And he's a shifty dude. Like, he's just somebody who can run routes relatively well. He uses his speed primarily for separation, not somebody who's going to be an after the catch threat. And, you know, if you miss out on Isaiah Bond early on and want to take a swing on somebody who has similar foundational traits, this is not a bad guy to do so. Continuing on, Mario Williams. So transferred from uh, Oklahoma to USC, then USC to Tulane this year. Uh, love Tulane, great school. And I think he's going to work actually really well for Tulane. Uh, the bottom line is, you know, he is somebody that is going to be very role specific. And if you can't tell, we did take a little bit of a tear jump. Like these are guys who I think might actually be able to stick to a roster. This is more of the bench players rather than the pro oh, spoiler alert, practice squad guys. And Jay Michael might be that guy who I think could be the one who can change that a little bit. But it's like pretty much a Jay Michael where I'm starting to think these guys could stick to a roster or a practice squad if need be. Shout out to Oli Pop, and you guys get some free ASMR with that. <laughs> but these are my notes of Mario Williams versus, say it with me, Arizona. Because Arizona was a monster defense last year. Like, they might not have the best record, but if you look at Arizona and all their games versus top-tier talent, they did a phenomenal job. And that's because they have two guys who I consider uh, top-tier cornerbacks and Takario Davis as well as Ephesians Prysock. But all those players are either well experienced or very talented or a combination of both. So let's continue though. Uh, he has nice route manipulation, but he ended up dropping the pass when he did so. That drove me nuts. I was like, oh, let's go. And then it's like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, he's not very effective versus press, but he does use physicality well for his size. He has a nice job navigating to soft spots in the zone, but he does have a slow curl overall. Not really somebody who's very noteworthy, but solid athlete, somebody that after the catch will make guys miss, can carry some dudes, good vision. Um, overall, like I'm straying from my notes here because they're pretty much all the same, but <laughs> but basically he's somebody that you want to get the ball to either deep because he can use some form of separation, uh, some form of physicality, or you want to get to him short and just let him kind of navigate and do his thing. So uh, Mario Williams overall, you know, again, somebody who I do think will be on a practice squad or on a roster. This is someone I'm a huge fan of. I'm super excited for, but his production dropped off so much over the past year. And he's going to Louisville. I think he's going to kick ass there. But I do have my concerns for Ja'Cory Brooks. Uh, he's 6'3", 195. This is one of those dudes I really have a lot of faith in. And the dude just needs to improve his hands. If he improves his hands... Like, look at this. So if he improves his hands, probably 5%, right? Just drops one ball le or a couple balls less a year. Um, he's instantly being vaulted up into the mid to upper or the mid to lower 20s. Like, that's how close you can get if you really improve your catching stats because that's 15% of your grade. So guys who just cannot catch, like, what's up, man? <laughs> like, get on the jugs machine. Regardless, this is Ja'Cory Brooks versus Texas. He was Bama transfer. Um, so he ended up catching. So fun fact, he got three balls for 30 yards. This is a game he didn't catch anything, but um, something I've become very comfortable with is looking at the style of receiver and being able to take away a lot from that. Ended up seeing some more, uh, ended up seeing some more of his tape before the year as well. But huh, I mean, at the end of the day, you're the player you are now. Some guys like to hold on to the pass. Some guys can reach it, but we'll see it Louisville this year. Regardless, there's no separation that he gets on a fade route, which is surprising because he actually has really good deep speed. Uh, he has a nice inside release to get into position, but does not seem to have great athleticism overall. I ended up realizing that because he just doesn't have the acceleration until he gets really deep. Um, he has deep speed and he's not very explosive. See, I end up contradicting myself because these are my live notes. I don't, I don't really create these for you. Really smooth 45 degree cuts that are sudden and evolved into a double move, which he ended up getting open deep. Uh, he has poor in and out routes, has a solid release package, but will like the ability to chop hands when being punched at the line. This dude can fly, and his acceleration is not as bad as I thought. He's just not super explosive. I uh, definitely love him going to Louisville. He has a stiff zig route. Oh, yeah, that was, it was really bad. I mean, I didn't even record it. I don't like recording the bad reps because I like to give some guys some positive, <laughs> some positive publicity because I end up shitting on him in these videos. 
Uh, deep threat for sure, but I can see him developing into much better receiver overall. Uh, yeah, just bottom line, I mean, he's some dude who needs to be consistent. Uh, he needs to catch the ball better. And, you know, the fact is he can play one role really well. That's kind of a slant and go guy. That is valuable. That is, because slants are timing, quick separation, and at 6'3", 195, that's a pretty unique frame to be able to be a slant and go guy. Uh, but he certainly can develop there. Louisville knows what they're doing. I uh, love Louisville players with all my heart. <laughs> like It's another one of those schools I'm a big fan of. Uh, Jalil Farouk is next. Ended up looking at his game versus Texas. So it was a, one of his higher, gra- ga- gr- <laughs> higher, ga- higher graded games. Hello. But still, um, he ended up being versus some solid defensive backs like Jedi Baron. So I like to be able to look at it. Um, I, something I did love about him, he's very, very powerful. And he's a smooth athlete. But just the route running overall was not very inspiring. Now, speaking of what I said here, he's not a very inspiring watch in any form of factor except for his physicality. Um, he has nice ball tracking deep. Uh, he has a nice job no- using downfield releases to get open. He has nice vision uh, when he has the ball, especially on a certain swing, and he's a fluid mover. And I think this is, again, where that spot is, where you can get these guys who will actually take a rep or two during the year. And it took us 14 dudes to get here. <laughs> but uh, I really do like his ability at the catch. I like his physicality. He's a really good blocker as well because he loves to just pretty much bench press corners. And at 6'1", 204, that's a very valuable asset. And a lot of these guys who are lower on the grades, you'll see very few of them have good catching ability. And if they do, that's probably a poor sign for the NFL because of the fact that um, they don't have very many other translatable traits. But uh, Jalil Farouk is someone who continued popping off to me in games every time I watched Oklahoma. So he's somebody who I like. But when you're looking at all these other receivers, you'll just understand that there is NFL talent, and then there's really fun college talent. And this is the guy who starts blurring those lines. Uh, Jordan Watkins is next. Talk about deep speed. Uh, deep speed threat. Uh, Jordan Watkins is exactly that. And there's certain players on here that I never even heard of, but um, the one one of the two guys who I get my tape from, Caddies, you guys can end up looking him up on Patreon. It's one of the guys who I'm allowed to talk about. Um, he ended up posting Jordan Watkins as well as this guy named Will Pauling, who we'll study later. And I'm like, who the hell are these guys? Well, I might as well watch them, right? I mean, like, shoot, they give me the tape. Let's go for it. So Jordan Watkins is a guy who I had never had on my list, but saw that there was a video posted on him like of all the receivers you're dropping all 22 on it's this dude let's check him out and really fun deep speed so let's talk about him versus bama i actually do have a clip on of him on my x so again follow me over there i did not expect to do this study but we ball there you go uh slow get off but he becomes a burner pretty much has no fake on his 45 degree cuts so you can just tell he telegraphs exactly what he's doing he's an awful blocker (laughs) <laughs> uh, he's heating up as a route runner, but still nothing special. Uh, weirdly bends into the slant before flipping his hips, which is not good because it's a heavy indicator that you're making a cut. Uh, I said, why is blood always lined up at the tight end? It's so strange. You'll see this dude lined up as pretty much quasi tight end. I'm like this guy's 5'11", 190. You're not fooling anybody. Just like the hat with a bald guy or a balding guy. It's like, or the comb over. It's like, that's the same thing. You're not, you're not getting fooled by Jordan Watkins being there. Um, the fact that he has the capacity to be a near elite route runner with how he flips his hips, just, but he does not choose to is very irritating. So, um, it's, it did kind of get me. He flips his hips very well, but he just doesn't do it right. You know what I mean? Like when you could see it, like I could see it with Jordan Watkins. I could see him being someone who could even be a starter on a roster and he just, don't do it. I'm like, oh, at Ole Miss of all things as well. Like that's a place where receivers really do apply themselves in that NFL route running way. But um, I digress. I digress. Let's get back to it. Um, poor awareness of the sideline, stepping out of bounds after a catch when there was a lot more ground available. You can see the explosiveness past the line of scrimmage, and he has some release packages, but they're kind of rudimentary. He's not a run after the catch guy, has not shown the ability to run high level route concepts that require sharp cuts, nor does he implement head fakes or any uh, sort of false indicators. He got jammed once. He's exclusively pretty much a burner. He has shown the ability to make catch in, uh, catch in traffic, so tight window catches. Um, he's not going to be a catch in traffic guy, though, most likely uh, through contact. Uh, he's not a contested catch guy either, but who would expect it for a sub six footer? 
he's role specific but that's a really good thing to have because this is i mean i debated putting the comparison as um well actually no i i wasn't gonna do it but it was just a comparison that popped into my head um calvin austin because he's like a really really reliable deep threat when healthy but i really really liked him like calvin austin somebody who i still have a ton of faith in as a route runner so if you took away the route running from Jor uh from calvin austin i could probably see him being like jordan watkins type uh but there's a role for that there really is so finally we're getting to the point where especially on the kick return rules i mean even though he's not great after the catch this is a guy where if you need someone to fly down the sideline or just pretty much break a home run hit might be your dude next is squirrel white gonna piss some people off with this one but uh i was a sucker for tennessee guys y'all know i'm the joe milton guy we'll see if that ends up biting me in the ass but it is what it is i like joe milton he was a six round pick so even if he ever gets a rep in the nfl it's kind of a win at this point but um i'm a sucker for tennessee man what can i say but this is his notes versus georgia he's been very unnotable over the start of the game He's not great at making guys miss, but he is solid with his open field of vision, which was a big surprise to me. At 165, I wanted to see him pretty much make somebody miss in a phone booth. Uh, he rounds his ins and out routes, surprisingly not as fast as I remember seeing him. He has a very high motor, but he ended up dropping a ball on a screen. I just don't understand how you have a, that bad of a drop rate. I mean, Joe Milton throws a freaking cannon rock for a ball, so maybe the ball's just moving that fast. Uh, which could boost his rating overall. So if you guys are mad about it, maybe he'll be better with a non-100 mile per hour throwing quarterback. He, Joe doesn't throw 100 miles per hour. I know that. It's, it's called hyperbole for a reason. But I digress. Um, he had one good in route at full speed. So at least there's that. I like that about him. He actually had some really good curl routes as well. And he ended up getting more explosive as the game went on. Still has great speed, but I'm talking about for 165, I thought this dude was like a legit super burner, like Jordan Watkins level. Uh, just did not have that. And honestly, like if I'm going to be real with you, I certainly believe that his hands grade could boost when you're not catching a ball from Joe Milton. Like Joe Milton has one of the strongest arms I've ever seen. It might be the strongest arm that I've ever seen. Him and Anthony Richardson back to back were pretty special. We don't have one of those in this class, but um, Squirrel White, I mean, he has a foundation that's really solid. I just want to see him make guys miss on a more regular basis because Georgia was the right opportunity. Those DBs are all NFL guys, and he wasn't able to make them miss. Uh, another one that's going to ruffle some feathers, Jeremy Bernard. So I was excited for him to be a top 10 receiver. Did not be, he was not so. <laughs> He's someone who also has around that 2% catch rate or drop rate. 2% <laughs> catch rate would be nuts, but, uh, you know, reliable catcher who just, I mean, coming from Washington, I just, you guys know, with Washington, there's solid blockers with poor route running. That's just Washington, man. And they're good catchers. Like, that's almost a guarantee. They at least have a foundation in blocking, release package, and catching. And they're actually pretty solid after the catch. And Jerry Bernard is exactly that. Remember, C is adequate. Like, it's adequate for the NFL. It's not great. It's not going to separate you from other players, but it also doesn't disqualify you. So let's read into his notes versus Arizona because he went to University of Washington. And that was actually a game where um, Washington struggled and Washington went all the way to the Natty. So uh, it's key. It's key to know this. So he ended up transferring to Bama to follow his head coach. He's the, it was his best statistical performance for Arizona too. So keep that in mind. But he also ended up having the most snaps versus high NFL talent. Uh, most of his reps led to uh, the best production. So to me, it made sense. It's also a red flag for those who underperform with touches. That's that's not specific game analysis. I ended up writing that for myself. But um, he ends up jogging a little bit more than I like. The Washington receivers are solid blockers. So, you know, it's that. But he was also the worst blocker of the UW receivers. Uh, he's been pretty much a screen guy early off in the game. He can get knocked off his route with physicality. But he also does at least push back. So that's a plus. Still gets moved. But at least the guys don't get a free pass for trying to get him off his route. Um, he can get knocked off his route physicality. Yeah, ended up saying that. Uh, it doesn't seem to ha to like a very sudden. Doesn't seem like a very sudden athlete or so explosive. Uh, he's kind of just more of a fluid guy, which is very indicative of Washington. They just have a type for receivers, and it's that. Uh, you can see him trying to do high level release moves, but he just hasn't moved past that threshold needed for them to be successful. He rounds his in and out routes. He saw it at sitting in soft spots, but I don't really see much translatability with his route running. 
it's a common thing. You'll go back and you'll see my same uh, comments about Jalen Polk. He's solid. At, okay, I ended up saying that. <laughs> Reading, Alex. Teleprompter. Come on. Uh, he takes reps in the backfield, so you know he's good after the catch. He's reliable there. He's possibly the worst blocker out of the receivers. See? There you go. Um, he ended up taking more reps at running back. So he's taking like legitimate, noticeable reps as a running back. It wasn't just a gimme play. Um, he ended up having a fumble when he ended up trying to fight for yards this game, which, I mean, it happens. He's not like a serial fumbler, so that's a plus. Uh, overall, really underwhelmed. I don't know what's up with Washington receivers, but they cannot run routes as well as other schools. And it happens. It happens. But, you know, running a route is kind of key to being a receiver, but it's not everything. And at least Jeremy is reliable when you get the ball in his hands. And he's reliable after he has the ball in his hands. That's kind of a strong foundation to have. For someone who could be a role player. Moose Muhammad. Moose and Muhammad the third. Uh, this is a guy who ended up grading as of last year. Ended up regrading him this year because I was like, why not? Right? Why as well. There's some more ASMR for you. Let's look at his notes versus Bama. He has a uh, nice vision on a drag route and he defeated a defender around the edge. So he showed a baseline top speed, but more so vision than anything. He curves his 90 degree cuts. He had a flash of contact balance by being able to drag for extra yards, not generating any form of separation. He has a little charge up step every time. Um, so there you go. The Will Shepard uh, charge up step. And then he's overall an interesting gadget weapon that's athletically not elite and probably more of a special teams guy. I can see Moose Muhammad also being transitioned to more of a running back role because of the more one cut ability, good vision, etc. But, you know, bottom line is I think that he has a reliable foundation with again similar to what we just talked about with jeremy bernard you get the ball in their hands and they're not most likely going to drop it and they're going to make you have like they're going to give the defense a tough time when the ball's in their hands so i do think that he's going to stick to a roster he's a fun player to watch it's just the top speed doesn't generate any form of separation because he's just not an elite athlete that way and um you know he's just under the nfl baseline for route running and that's okay because route running can develop. But, you know, hands sometimes have a hard time developing. We're going to Keandre Lambert Smith, former Penn State wide receiver, transferring to, I was about to say Arkansas, Auburn. <laughs> so, Auburn, don't know why you transfer there, fall places. Um, I probably should have done a little bit more research on that. If you guys have more input, maybe his family's from Auburn, from like Alabama, like feel free to drop that down in this, the comment section below. But, Let's look at his notes versus Michigan because those are some good ass DBs. So he has nice quick feet. He got locked up by Will Johnson in the short range. Ended up having a small portion of this talking about Will Johnson being a freaking god, but uh, I'll skip that portion. He has solid hip flips on his outs. He just gives hella indicators when he's bending into it. You know, when I was talking about Jordan Watkins bending into his 45 degree cuts, Keandre Lambert Smith bends before his route cut. The first time I ever saw something like that, um, it was a, I'm forgetting the name of the receiver, South Carolina, the Panthers drafted him, I think in the fifth or sixth round, Shai Smith. He just, you can tell when they're about to make a cut. And if I can tell, I can guarantee you a defender who's been studying him all week can tell. So, uh, he gives really, really strong indicators before his cuts. He has solid hip flips on his 45 degree cuts. He can build speed up, but not overly explosive with his get off. He took his eye off the ball on a quick out. Um, and so there you go. There's a drop there. Uh, flashed upper arm release downfield. I like, um, I like, what the hell? <laughs> I like how he, what the, I don't even know what the hell I'm typing here, man. I mean, I'm not even looking at what I'm typing, but, uh, oh, I like his hezzy steps, his hezzies. I, I've never seen that word in my life and I'm the one who typed it. Um, his hesitation steps, but he does get a little unnecessary and wasted with his movement. Uh, he performs his double moves well, so that's a plus as well. Uh, this is one of those dudes who I do think can have a lot of success. Like, you know, he has a really strong foundation of intricacy. 45 degree cuts with a hip flip is key. The hard cuts, that's going to be pretty hard to master. If you're giving indications, like that's just really tough habit to break. Uh, but the release package, super key. You have the good speed as well. And, um, you know, the fact is, if you have that release package and the defenders can't press you, like as effectively as the other guys before, uh, that to me is very translatable. Versus press, speed, release, those are 
arguably the three most crucial categories for showing if you can at least make a roster because it shows intricacy, it shows adaptability, and it shows overall top end ability. And um, obviously everything else plays a major factor, hence why it's part of the grading scale, but that's more so the baseline to make it. So let's talk about Kobe Pacer next. This dude, I think, I'm not forgetting. No, that was um, that was another receiver who ended up breaking both of his feet. Like RIP to that dude. Um, forgetting his name off the top of my head. It might be Mumpfield, but no, he was from Pitt. Uh, it was a receiver who got recommended to me. I think it was Jennings. He got recommended to me and I was like very excited to watch him. And then I'm like, dude, this guy took no reps this year. And it's because he broke one foot and then he broke another foot. RIP to that dude. But Kobe Pacer has been dealing with some stuff uh, injury wise. So let's look at his game versus South Carolina because South Carolina got some dogs in that secondary. He's not an overwhelming athlete. He has good vision and he ended up having it on a screen. So, you know, you can get the ball in his hands and he can make the most out of it. Uh, he's smooth and efficient with his 45 degree cuts. He's stiff though on his 90 degrees. He has sudden burst on a fade route that was for a touchdown. And he ended up having a poor adjustment to a deep fade. So like TBD on that, like it's pretty much a 50-50 as to whether I like him as a deep threat. Like he doesn't have the overall top end speed to generate that separation. But the fact is, I really did love the fact that he kind of can vary his speed. And when you vary your speed, defenders have a hard time being step for step with you. And like having that ex acceleration was kind of key for him being so high on this list. Like basically being someone who could generate micro separation. That's what I call it. Um, that's how you win in the NFL. So excited for him to stay healthy. Really am. I hope that he really can stay healthy and be um, a very big contributor. But, you know, Kobe Pacer, uh, it's still very role specific. Here's where the big feathers are ruffled. I ended up watching multiple games of Evan Stewart over again because of the fact that I did not like my analysis of him because it made me feel bad that I didn't like Evan Stewart. And I still couldn't get on board. I really want to, guys. But the bottom line is, I mean, if you look at the grading scale, it's pretty indicative of the fact that, you know, it makes sense. 175, you're probably not going to be good versus the press. The guys who are, are kind of special to me. Contested catch, who the hell is throwing a contested catch ball to someone who's sub 180? If you do and they're good at it, that's someone who you want to keep around. And then he doesn't look like he's a formidable blocker. There's not everyone's going to be Tez Johnson. So um, speaking of, that's going to be his teammate this year. It's going to be a thin receiving core, but I digress. Um, Evan Stewart, let's talk about his, I mean, I ended up looking at his game versus Bama and Tennessee. I've talked about Bama so much. Let's look at his Tennessee game. And it was honestly versus easier defensive backs. So keep that in mind. That was my last study. You always remember, it's like sequentialism. You remember the first and the last, the best. And I was like, let's give him the best chance possible. Let's look versus, you know, still NFL level talent or roughly like fringe NFL talent. But let's look at the guys who, you know, aren't as good as like legitimate first round talents, right? Because, uh, I mean, he graded even lower than this the first time around. So, yes, I did boost his grade. But versus Tennessee, uh, there's a lot of steps that look good until you see they're not fooling anyone. So he's more of a show than tell guy. Uh, good acceleration on a fade, but he did not track the ball well and he ended up dropping it. He has a nice skinny post, those 45 degree cuts. I love them. He's he's very sudden, very smooth with it. Uh, another poorly tracked fade. So far, the dude's been a 45 degree cut and fade guy, even though he ended up not executing the fades overly well. Uh, he had a nice push off on a curl, but did not sell the deep route well enough, not generating enough separation. Um, basically, what that means is what you want to do is make the defender think you're continuing to go up, but in reality, you're coming back. <laughs> I, it's the game of being a receiver is all manipulation. Like you either want to be so sudden of an athlete that the defender cannot react in time for you to be for them to be in position or more likely. And you make a defender think you're doing something entirely different so that they're not in the position to make the play. Uh, he doesn't really do that that well. I digress. Um, so he finally had a gorgeous comeback route. I was dying for it. Hence why he has a C plus again, it's adequate. That's above adequate. So again, reminding because not everybody's going to be listening to every single one of these and very few of you will, but I love you guys regardless. If you are at this point, comment, I love you because <laughs> I could use all the love I can get because I'm about to get 
absolutely cooked by people who haven't watched all these players, and that's okay. But regardless, back to it. He's fast, but he's not a burner. He bends into his routes too much, but he has shown the ability to break down and cut sharply. Uh, he finally tracked a ball well on a crossing route. The release package primarily is just sidestepping a defensive back and trying to run past him. Uh, his stop routes are solid, just 90 degree cuts are mid as F. Kind of half-assing reps where he is not a primary read. Having a tough time versus Kamal Hayden and Press. I wonder why. Because Hayden's probably like 35 pounds heavier than him. Um, nice full body extension on a catch over in the middle. Uh, but he still had a... I said he still has a mid-ass in route. Uh, he has not made an impact after the catch so far. Indicated a stop route, but that has not really been the norm. So hopefully he does end up bouncing back, which... I mean, I thought it was fine enough overall. Indicated, oh, I just said that. Bro just bumped into a defensive back and stopped his whole ass route. I really don't like his game versus the press. Um, he just, he cannot handle it. Smart stop uh, in the hole or in the hole of the zone on a crossing route. Uh, tensing up too much before a comeback now that the DB is in front of him, um, meaning he's not selling enough being able to run a streak. And he just needs to be sudden. Uh, basically, he's indicating... Like, you can tell when he's about to cut. He's, he tenses up. He gets stiff. Um, but regardless, he I ended up just ending off my analysis by saying Max Johnson sucks ass. Which, I like Max Johnson. But, you know, Evan Stewart's in a good situation right now. He's very role-specific. But, you know, release package versus press and speed are the key foundations. And one of the route running abilities, I would say. And he has one of the route running abilities. He has the release. He has the speed. Just needs to get better versus press. JoJo Earl's next. Um, FTCU, by the way. I'm an SMU alum, so I'll like put that in there. But I kind of like TCU players. Jared Wiley last year was one of my guys. More ASMR for you beautiful people. Um, this is a game versus Texas. It took until play 49 for him to get a rep, but we ball. He's definitely athletic and can flip his hips. He has a nice missed tackle force ability. Uh, but he's taking only one rep every 15-ish, which sucks, but he's getting targeted at a very high rate. He curves his 90-degree cuts, and he actually has a little bit of punch with his blocks. It was so funny. He's a little itty-bitty guy, 176. I mean, I'm saying that, and I'm like 165, but, you know, I ain't no JoJo Earl. Uh, but, you know, it's still fun to see someone who does have that size be able to be physically imposing. He curves his 45-degree cuts two primary or he ends up cutting his curving his 45 degree cuts too much uh and he tries to leverage his athleticism to get open over actual route running he got absolutely cooked by press downfield he's more explosive than fast but like to me uh that's a really solid foundation for someone who's going to be more of a gadget player the gadget key is burst and run after the catch ability and you know top and speed kind of key but you kind of want burst, rack ability, and hands for someone who's going to be primarily a gadget. And JoJo Earl has that. Like, he's going to be someone who I really do like as, you know, one of those dudes who comes in and is more that screen slash um, guy that you end up tossing a little jet sweep to. Next, we got Nate McCollum. Nate McCollum is a very interesting study. He's one of the dudes who I ended up just writing down while, you know, watching other receivers being like, hmm. I actually kind of like this guy. Let's talk about him. So uh, let's talk about his game versus Clemson. He got 20 targets versus Minnesota. I ended up watching the game versus Minnesota too, by the way. Um, we could toss it in. We'll toss both of those game in. Because I ended up mentioning it. I can't like, I can't tease you like that. This video is long enough as it is. Um, he has a flash of hand technique to get into proper positioning. That's cool. Uh, not great off the line, but he builds up speed. He bends his 45 degree cuts. So not a fan of that. Loki just had one good rep besides running, primarily fade routes. Underwhelmed overall. Nice swim move downfield and tried to uh, do a route fake, but he just did not have the explosiveness to generate separation. He did a good job on his inside releases. Um, did I not? No, I did. Okay, freaking. I was looking at the light, and it just ended up changing my color on the B+. And y'all know, I always make like one coloration mistake on the entire thing. I already did it with my uh, number 56, but anywho. Uh, he drifts on his hip flips. So like when they're running, you could tell the guys who like flip their hips and then they could redirect themselves. Well, he like would flip his hips, but then still be drifting while running. It's like, 
you know, flip the hips and like actually flip them. Uh, but also looking at the Minnesota game, he has nice deceleration on the soft spot curl. Uh, he could not pull in a sideline pass, which, you know, 5'9", 185, probably not going to be that type of dude. Uh, he had a good catch in traffic on a bubble because he ended up getting popped because a dumbass in front of him didn't do a good job. Um, he did not make a guy miss in one-on-one, -on -one, which I really do look at that for run after the catch ability. Like, do you make a guy miss? Are you able to get that extra yard? Do you go down right away? Like, those are things that go through my mind when I'm looking at that. Um, catching traffic from a big hit, uh, may has not done a good job during that Minnesota game. He really didn't not going to lie. I like the number 88 tight end. I'm just saying that right now. I don't know who that is. So it's going to be a guy who I toss in probably hopefully into, um, the overall analysis, but, or for the deep dive for the tight ends, he has a good sit in zone. That was kind of a co common thing for him. That's why he has a plus one factor, by the way, like he knows where to sit. He rounds his 90 degree cuts. Uh, he's a smooth mover in space, but he does not make anyone miss. Oh, he has not very good vision in open space um, the way I thought he had earlier. Finally flashing some juice on a great post route, uh, taking a lot of elongated steps before bursting on a cut, and it's just awful for timing. Yeah, he does like a lot of weird hesitation stuff. Like NFL is not going to be down for that dude. Like you got to get open. Uh, nice double move on sideline catch. To be honest, I am not a fan of his route running, but he does... Um, but he uses his hands to almost redirect himself when he bumps into a defender. So it's very intriguing. His uh, game gave some context to show the consistent lows and high level flashes. So like, I don't like watching the best of the best games, but sometimes when I don't feel comfortable fully knowing a player, seeing them with the ball in their hands and maybe how they win is really, really key. I like to see how guys win even in their losses though. That's like super key for me. Continue on, Xavier Restrepo. This is a guy part of the first one, so I'll keep these notes short versus Clemson. Um, he has some nasty 90-degree cuts. His route running overall is really solid. He's not someone who's like, he does kind of take a long time to build up speed, but he has a limited top speed. Ended up being more the acceleration. Uh, he has a tough time versus press, not doing much after the catch. He just has a hard time getting to his top speed. But I think the fact is, because he wasn't moving at a very fast rate when he got to the break point, he ends up cutting a lot easier because he's not having to slow down as much. But when you do see him on the vertical routes, he can def definitely build up some speed there. And that's why he was a pretty reliable threat there at Miami. And I'm excited to see him do that again. Dane Key is next. So we're starting to see the guy who, like, I ended up saying at the end, so I'm going to spoil it. Uh, if he gets more consistent, he'll be in a starting rotation. So this is a guy who easily could be going up one, if not two tiers. And he has a frame for it. 6'3", 195. More ASMR for you beautiful people. So uh, his top speed is limited. He does have some flashes of physicality. He has a very nice in route. So 90 degrees, especially after we've been hearing all these mediocre ass um, 90 degree cuts, which are ins and outs. It's kind of nice to have two dudes in a row. Um, I said, oh my Lord, he faked an in swim move and he went out or he ended up faking it in. Then he did the swim move out. So he was like running like this and then he faked in and then he swam over the defender to go out. I love that. And especially versus Bama, these are top end players. Uh, he's a willing blocker, excellent job hand fighting and repositioning. There's a flash of deep speed, but I just do not see it on a regular basis. I'm loving the physicality to gain separation. And he does have nice quick feet on a slant, but he did juggle an initial ball. Ended up um, realizing that his drop rate's not that not that ideal, um, but he ended up having to catch in traffic. I wish he would use physicality more because he does use it well. If he gets more consistent, he will be in a starting rotation. That's the bottom line. I mean, the dude has the foundation there and it's not consistent enough, but this is the first guy that I believe in to be worth it. So super excited for him. Uh, continuing on, we got Brennan Presley here. Brennan Presley's fun. Um, he's a little itty bitty guy. Like he got the minus four because he's really itty bitty at 160. But um let, let's let's talk about him. Let's talk about him versus Texas of all games. Because if you're in the Big 12, probably playing a game versus Texas. Uh I'm pretty sure if I'm not Oklahoma State's Big 12, right? They're not SEC. No, they're Big 12. But I mean, obviously UT has a heritage of being in the Big 12, but anyways, um versus Texas, Brennan Presley, so far, relatively fluid. He's a tiny little fella. Uh, he's not afraid to block, and he ends up bending uh, before he ends up cutting on his slants, but he hasn't done it too much. Uh, he gets out physical, obviously. 
Uh, he has a nice spin, move, and open space. He can flip his hips well. It is so interesting. He moves well and has release packages, but it's almost like his legs are too short, and he generates no separation with it. It's kind of sad. It really was. Like, you could tell it works, but, you know, I digress. Surprisingly solid after the catch in terms of contact balance. Uh, solid job sitting in soft, spo soft spots in the zone. His quarterback is absolute cheeks. Some quarterbacks really piss me off when I watch receiver tape. Great head fakes. He just does not generate enough separation with it because I think his legs are too short. Overall impressed, but a huge concern when it comes to translatability. Uh, I think that says it all. Like, it's so weird. His legs just seem so short that you just couldn't see him, like, have the ability to cover enough ground to generate the separation that his body really should. Rock Taylor is next. Uh, this is a game versus Charlotte. Memphis receiver, big dude. I mean, you're looking at this right now and you're seeing a deep threat who's kind of more of that red zone guy. Like, you can build up some speed. You have a good release package. You're a good contested catcher. And if you're running the ball, this guy's not going to be a liability. So keep that in mind. Solid blocker so far. He has nice use of physicality at the top of his routes. He had a nice inside release on a double move. Uh, he's really solid in release packages. And he also ended up having a really nice slant off of one. Uh, overall, not really overall great, but again, above adequate. Unleashed his deep speed. Does not need to hesitate as much because he ends up doing hezzy moves. Again, I hate wasted movement. Like sometimes it works, but some guys just have a habit of doing that. He curves his in routes. Uh, he's a great blocker and he's tough to bring down. So uh, really interesting. He's going to be very role specific, but... You know, I'm kind of excited to see what he can do. Like, he he is someone who I did really believe in as someone who should be seeing snaps in the NFL. And that's why he is going to be one of those dudes who is on that flex list. He is. He's on that flex list. But continue. Or he's on the developmental list, which is guys who can be getting some reps in there. Uh, but technically, no. He is technically flat. It's weird. It's a weird system that I put in here. Caden uh, Prather's next, though. I studied his game versus Ohio State, 6'3", 210, X build. Um, he ended up starting off the game with a nice contested catch touchdown, which he has a good contested catch rate. It's interesting the guys who are good at the contested catch but can't catch the regular passes. I, It is what it is. But uh, he's not very snappy with his movement. Uh, he has nice acceleration uh, outside. He has nice acceleration on an outside release, but he did not gain too much of vertical separation after the initial burst. Of course, we're talking about two guys who I have in my top 20 as the boundary corners, but those are the guys who are going to go to the NFL. Um, he got the burners, and he had a nice inside release. He had a great comeback route. He dropped an open field catch when making great route ad adaptation. Um, then he had, oh, he was, I said he was okay 99% of the plays. The top speed um, is, just, is just not there. So I said, okay, 99% of the plays, the top speed is just not there, but the top speed overall you can see it uh, slipped an arm tackle and then went right into another defender. Oh, I saw that. He literally like he broke a tackle and then he just straight up rather than kind of evading contact, just went directly. There was all the other ways he could go <laughs> right into the next dude. Uh, it was funny. I do remember that one pretty, pretty uh, vividly. I would like him to sell fade or go more on his out routes. Like I was talking about that uh, route fake to basically make guys not understand what you're going to do. He ended up dropping when catching, uh, catching traffic ball when he got hit in the back, but he's overall a really solid player. Um, just got to watch out for those hands, man. You just got to, you got to catch more. Cannot be doing these drops, man, but six, three, two, ten with some good athleticism and um, a good release package. Again, this is a guy who's going to be a red zone threat and I'm excited for it. I just wish the blocking were better too, though. Brew McCoy broke my heart, dude. Bro, bro fractured his leg. Um, still remember that game too. Like, Brew McCoy is my guy. He really is. But let's talk about him. Uh, these are in notes versus Florida. Ended up having a season-ending leg fracture, so TBD on who he still is. But um, we have seen guys come back from it. It's not like I'm pretty sure it wasn't an actual muscle injury on top of the leg break. But you know, bones heal back much better than like muscles in my opinion and in a lot of doctors opinions as well uh, he's not overly explosive or fast he got knocked a bit off his path with some press uh slightly rounded in route but he ha keeps his momentum well through the break 
surprisingly not ass in open space after the catch. Uh, he's very top speed limited. Nice hand fighting to get into the best position. He ended up having a pass breakup um, in catch and traffic, so he dropped the ball when um, he was getting hit. Very solid blocker. God, his top speed is so bad. Showed a little top end speed, but man, it takes him 10 years to get there, and it's still not good. Uh, great at using physicality to gain separation. I just don't know if he has athleticism to make it as a wide receiver. Maybe gain 20 pounds and become a tight end, or maybe drop 10 pounds to get more juice. Then I ended up looking at him this year. He's up 10 pounds. So this guy could be a quasi tight end in my opinion. And I think that's actually really good for him because he's a good route runner and an F speed and burst for a tight end, like based on his skill set, because he's a good blocker, good size, and um, you know, pretty polished overall. I think like if you're looking at him as a pure tight end, he would probably have that C plus speed and C plus acceleration. So um, I think that that's going to be a little bit more key for him, but I'm not going to grade him as a tight end because there's not really much to translate at the moment, but something to keep in mind. Uh, Dante Thornton's next, staying in Tennessee, graded three of the Tennessee guys. I had to be a little bit tricky with this one. On Caddies and my other source, they didn't have any games for Dante Thornton. So I ended up looking up at Andrew Phillips tape uh, versus Tennessee. So that was uh, entertaining. I was pretty resourceful on that. Pretty proud of that. But this dude's fun. This dude's really fun. So he has really good contact balance. He's okay on his curl routes. He can flip his hips, uh, but his inside release was very rudimentary. He can absolutely burn. This is the dude who had a 24 mile per hour top speed, by the way. It's been tested, apparently. Apparently, he said he can get up to 24. Oh, look at that. Man, I read myself sometimes. <laughs> at six foot five, he moves unbelievably well. Uh, Might have gotten injured early on, but that wasn't true. They just... Tennessee does this thing where they sub out wide receivers for a whole ass drive it is what it is. Um, he ended up, he just pops off compared to the other receivers on the team. Uh, he has nice field vision and he did improve on his sharp cuts overall. He's a really powerful blocker. He can get moved by press, but overall I'm a huge fan of his potential. I don't know what's up with it in this class, but the larger guys are like six, 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 five. Most of them are not great versus the press. And, um, I'm hoping they use more physicality, but Dante Thornton, like he has unreal ability for someone of that size. Like I was debating putting him as like MVS because of the fact that he's like kind of a route running deep burner, at a very good frame. But um, I, I really do love his game. And I think that he's going to be somebody that really pops off in preseason when he ends up being drafted in the seventh round or something. But he's going to be someone who's probably running the four threes, four twos at six, five, two, 14. That would be insane. But Trey Harris is next. Uh, he was part of the original, so keep that in mind. It's going to ruffle feathers, but bottom line, he's a great athlete. Like, really solid athlete. For 6'2", if you have anything in the Bs, that's really solid. B plus is great. He's a great athlete who's, again, just really rudimentary in terms of the majority of his game, but talk about pretty much being good at everything, like, or passable at everything. That's Trey Harris for you. Uh, but this is notes versus Georgia. Keep it short and sweet because we already talked about him before. Instantly, uh, he instantly is at his top speed. So I love that about him. He flashes some release packages, but not overall. Um, pretty much rudimentary. He has nice physicality versus Kamari, and he ended up getting a nice catch in traffic. He's mentally toying with Kamari, so it's very entertaining. He had an okay 180 degree cut, so a curl. Um, he has pretty solid hands. And he has okay 45 degree cuts. He's just not really an effective route runner. So again, somebody who you can't complain about in pretty much any category except statistically for a catcher. And then most Ole Miss guys, I don't really look at them as reliable blockers. I'm like that, that hasn't been a staple of the Ole Miss program. You look at the old, you look at Washington's program, now Alabama, like those dudes were blockers. Um, like that was a staple of their game. Like I couldn't find someone who couldn't be a passable blocker. Even Jeremy Bernard was a passable blocker. Uh, Ole Miss, I felt like it's a little bit more variation. It wasn't a staple of their program, which is okay. But let's go on to someone who's going to be a little bit more exciting to me. And I, I really like Sam Brown, uh, formerly Houston. And um, he was West Virginia to Houston to now the U. Uh, very excited for that. Because you also lost one of the guys who we'll, we'll be talking about. Uh, but you know, it's nice to see that they got somebody to replace him. He is very role specific by the way, but, um, he had a nice double move to start off the day. I remember seeing that like a freaking corner just 
per, he got so lucky. Um, they had a nice double move to start the day. Did get pushed off a little bit by the DB. Uh, he had a good track and high point, but he ended up dropping a high point catch, which super unlike him. He literally went up and he caught it and he came down, the ball popped out. And I was like, oh, I was really hoping because at that point I didn't know his drop rate. I was really hoping that wasn't indicative of like a 16% drop rate. It was not. Some guys just make mistakes, man. It's okay. It happens to the best of us. Uh, you cannot generate separation against tight press. Um, that's just because I found out he's not a very good route runner. But um, he has good open field vision. He weirdly curls his in routes. So it's like like very, very, very not NFL translatable. Um, he's a really solid athlete. He bends his 45 degree cuts, but he does maintain his speed. He continues to curl his 90 degree cuts super duper hard, and he's pretty much just running into open areas, which works, but I don't know how that will fare versus NFL defenses. Um, he's a definition of a deep slash run after the catch threat. Uh, he has one okay, he had one okay outside release, and that's about it. Really needs to learn how to lean into defenders pre-cut. Talking about that physicality to gain leverage. Dude can make plays or can make guys miss in a phone booth. That's why he's an A plus in rack ability. Um, role specific, but he's damn good in that role. So that clip is on my Twitter as well. Feel free to look it up. It's at Hail Mary Sports with two S's, but just go to that link tree, man. The link tree, you just click a button on and you're there. You don't have to do the guesswork. You don't have to do any of the work except for just clicking twice. So again, that's why I keep emphasizing that. I made it for you guys so that you can have like kind of just an all in one place to make it super easy for you for everything. And I also made it for Broshmo too. So if you ever see that, I don't know if he's deployed it yet, but um, you know, if you ever see that, I'm gonna take responsibility for it. But Sam Brown's super fun. I mean, Houston is not a place where I really see um, much apart from like Tank Dell in terms of like really route development and tank Dell is probably the best of the best but tank Dell is also itty bitty guy and he's also more of an outlier than anything uh sam brown's just i i knew houston to be a spot where you see guys who are elite after the catch and really solid athletes so very excited for that i'm drinking this now because i'm about to get absolutely fucking cooked ted roe mcmillan's next and this is gonna ruffle feathers but i will have this caveat I have specific role specific grades and it's for things like red zone possession, deep threat after the catch route runner. And Tete Roa is graded essentially as a starter in possession in red zone as he should. So this is an overall holistic grade. This is not role specific for the role specific for Tete Roa McMillan. He is graded as a top 50 player for me, if not top 32. Really want to emphasize that. Like he is a top 10 receiver for me in this specific role. But I ended up putting a Twitter poll out there where you guys voted that you wanted only overall grades. I respect that. And I think that's fine. And you know what? It gives me a reason to end up having videos that break down the guys who I think will be looked at in specific roles. So Tetra McMillan will be one of them. So keep that in mind. Uh, arguably the best hands I've ever seen. Like someone who, it doesn't matter what defense you're playing on him, he's going to catch it. My issue is he pretty much is a deep threat and a red zone threat. He's not a great route runner, especially not on the like more high level routes. And um, he's not going to be someone who after the catch is going to be making dudes miss. And I'm worried about him versus NFL corners who can go up and contest the ball better than college corners. But he does go up against, he went up against Takario Davis as well as Ephesians Prysock every day in practice. Like no wonder he ended up feasting on the more inferior corners. But let's look at my notes of him. Um, ended up looking at U UCLA and Mississippi State. I actually like the Mississippi State corners more. So we'll read that game. Um, so he ended up having a slow ass zig route. I ended up posting about some of this stuff on my Twitter as well. The only strength so far is sitting in a good spot in zone. It's honestly a good thing at least to have. Uh, solid inside release can build up speed in a straight line, but most of the time generates zero separation. Uh, he caught a curved five yard out versus off coverage. He ended up having a really nice deep catch. Uh, I did underrate his athletic ability because this is a big boost from the first time I graded him, by the way. Uh, he just cannot run his normal routes for shit. His 45 degree cuts were okay. 
uh, he does he does not rely uh, does not rely too much in the open field. I don't even know what the fuck I was saying there, but uh, he flashed downfield release. Forty five deg degree cuts are quite solid. Uh, I can see it the more I watch him. It's just going to be very role specific. The bottom line is people have him graded as a top 10 player in the class because they're grading him at that one role. And again, I'm not going to grade every single receiver. Like I'm not going to grade them as their best role off the bat because I think it's good to see how all the receivers compared to each other respectively as an overall receiver. I think these grades create a solid foundation, but I do think it really does matter because the team who's drafting him most likely are going to draft him for a specific role. We can't promise, though, that that's the role they're going to go into. So it's key to be able to talk about them as a holistic receiver. But when we will get into the possession receiver grades, you bet your ass Tetero is going to have a much higher grade. And it's just a reweight of the categories. Emphasis on contested catch, on hands, uh, release package, less on the speed, even though that's kind of a key thing for Tetero. But, um, you know, he's a he's a fun project to have because if you use him exclusively as a possession receiver, I think he's going to be, I think he could be a top 32 receiver in the NFL easily on the lions because that's a role that is, I mean, I think he'd be a top 15 receiver in the NFL if he goes to the lions I'm saying it right now, that's my dream fit of all teams. That's the team I want most to get to Jerome McMillan. I think he'll be a top 15 receiver. Just feel free to quote that top 15 receiver in the NFL. If he goes to the Lions, I think he will outclass Amon Ross St. Brown on that team because everybody's going to be focused on Amon Ross separation. Tete Roa is going to be a combination of a deep threat with Jameson Williams, as well as someone that you just cannot guard. Either you're going to be double teaming the hell out of Tete Roa or else, which means everybody else is going to be getting open or else you're going to be playing so much off coverage because you have so much speed with Tetaroa as well as Jameson Williams, that there's going to be so much open field and Tetaroa thrives in soft spots. So um, I really do love Tetaroa. His grade may be a 20, like a 66.75 is more of, you know, again, that flex slash fringe guy. But I think that there's just a far higher degree that we need to discuss with Tetaroa. And that's going to really depend on the team he goes to. So overall as a receiver, I think he's lacking in a lot of areas. But in a certain role that I really see happening, I could totally see him being there for the Lions. I think he could be game changing. So keep that in mind. One of the guys, like when I say role specific, there's guys who really can be like super special as role specific. Ameka Abuka is next though. Uh, you know, this is somebody who really, really let me down. Really let me down. I was very excited for him to prove me wrong. I ended up watching him a couple more times, actually. <laughs> like, I ended up re-watching him, actually, a couple times. Uh, but looking at his game versus Michigan, he's sudden with his 45-degree cuts, but he ended up dropping a pass. Um, he flashed his deep speed down the middle. So there you go. we're seeing the positives pop out. His curls have been overall extremely mediocre. Uh, he curves his out routes, so his, overall his hard-cutting ability is just not there. He has piss poor fade routes overall. He gets thrown off by press coverage, and I'm extremely underwhelmed since um, the first two drives of Michigan game. The first two drives set you set the expectation that this guy should be a first round pick. And the fact is, you can see it because he does have two drives where he is arguably a first round pick. But the game of NFL doesn't come down to two drives. It comes down to how consistent you are on an every down basis because you only get lucky on five plays maybe a game if that and if you're only good for two drives there's not a very high likelihood that one of like maybe more than one even if one of those plays lands on those two drives so that was something i saw but of course he's been dealing with a lot of health issues i uh, could have dropped him even more for that decided not to because i think that you know his overall game showed the lack of um health in it so i'm hoping he bounces back but there's a lot of receivers in this class that I really, really like, like Antonio Williams, wide receiver out of Clemson. Uh, very, very exciting player to watch, like somebody who also randomly popped up in caddies. So more ASMR for you beautiful people. He ended up getting hurt mid-year, 
And he ended up coming back to finish off the last two games. Ended up looking at his game versus Kentucky because at that size, I could definitely tell that um, there's some Drew uh, Phillips tape on him. And to me, that's kind of key. So uh, he had a nice inside release and he had some solid deep speed versus Andrew Phillips. Uh, good after the catch ability, quick feet. Change of direction is not elite in space. He has a hard time decelerating. Between a, or He's been a sweep and bubble receiver primarily. Great flash of deep speed on a post with a 45 degree cut. So it's a post that's a 45 degree cut. He had a smooth post route with some good speed, bottom line. I think I, I think I ended up posting that one, TBD. But great block versus uh, Harrison downfield. Really do like Harrison as well. He had a nice post corner um, with a burst out of his cut. So that's why 45 degree cut it's graded so highly. Um, great block versus, oh, I already said that, Lamau. Uh, I can definitely see the it factor with him. Like it just works. He had a nice sit in soft zone near the first down on a long and uh, a first, like a pretty much a third down in distance. Uh, another curl sitting in soft zone with a good spot. Uh, would say his release package does not show up much, but he does flash it from uh, from time to time on fades and such. Overall, this will be relatively incomplete because he was still healing up, so TBD on that. But I really did like what I saw. Uh, bottom line is, I see the foundation of the release package not there enough. Um, he really knows how to run those posts and post corners, and he has the speed to do so. So I think he's a little role specific to start out, but somebody who has a lot to potentially grow and develop, especially when healthy. Continuing on, Andrell Anthony ended off the year with an unfortunate leg injury. Um, so that sucks. But, you know, I ended up seeing the game versus Texas where he actually hurt himself. Um, it's a game we'll be talking about. And I actually saw him get thrown by the defender. and His leg just got caught under him. Very, very unfortunate. Uh, he has a very smooth 45 degree cut. He did curve it, but he did it quick. Uh, so he maintained momentum. He's a really good athlete. Stops. Uh, his stop routes are not bad, but they're also not very elite. Uh, curved 90 degree cuts, but he does carry momentum well. I don't know if I care that much about it. Ended up posting that on my Twitter. Um, he had a great sideline catch, also part of that play. He's a feisty blocker. He had a good attempt to alter his route for a bigger play. I know, I think it was an in route and he banked it towards uh, the end zone. Uh, I'm worried about his ability to fight off press coverage or fight off press because the release package is just not there. And only in breaking routes have been effective versus press because he ends up pushing off a little bit. Uh, nice evasion of a tackler in open space. He does a nice job of coming back to the ball on curls. Also, a lot of the Oklahoma guys, they do a very good job of that. They end up pretty much running their curl and then continuing to come back. I don't know how much I love that overall because a defender can basically lurk at that point, but I digress. Uh, he can really generate separation with bursts on micro cuts, micro separation. Um, the ball popped out on a catch in traffic. He ended up hurting his knee the next play. So uh, someone who I have a lot of respect for. He is, based on not having that injury, he would have been a top 15 receiver. So uh, someone who I like, great athletic foundation, ended up pretty much being rudimentary in the release package. But again, just somebody that, uh, more of that deep threat who has that route running ability. It is a little bit concerning though that, you know, versus the press, there's only one route that was pretty effective but you know it's something that you can develop in time kyron lacy is next uh, i do like kyron lacy 6'2 213 kind of like the one guy who's kind of forgotten there with uh, brian thomas as well as malik neighbors so this is a game versus florida state pretty slow on his hard cuts but he ended up being pretty efficient with it Good use of physicality, saw it out, uses his hesitation moves a lot, but not over the top to where it's detrimental. They can still fix it up a little bit though. He slipped a tackle in open space for um, quite a few yards. His top speed does appear to be more limited than what I'd like. And that's of course with the frame of him being an LSU receiver. <laughs> yeah, like LSU guys, they were four, three burners. So you could tell the difference. Uh, Solo Curl ended up dropping a catch in traffic though. Out route king, low key. He can cut on a dime. He makes micro cuts easily as well. A uh, great variation of his release package. Uh, route running seems to be less effective at higher speeds, which I guess makes sense because of physics reasons. But uh, another drop on his catch in traffic on a poor zig route. He uses good body position overall. His top speed is not bad, but it's just not as consistently as pressive as the freak athletes next to him. Uh, Greedy Vance is doing a great job, especially for the 50-pound difference on him and Kyron Lacey. 
Um, has yet to do anything run after the catch wise since his first catch. Overall impressed, but not the level of Malik Neighbors and not the physical upside of Thomas. Kind of a dumbed down version of the two combined with less run after the catch ability. That's a pretty good get. I gotta admit, if you're getting him like third round, fourth round, that's a pretty good get. Uh, Kyron Lacey, certainly somebody to keep your eyes out on. Will Pauling's next. Spoiled him. Uh, another one that I was just like, who the hell is this dude? Saw his name pop up as like one of the guys who had some all 22 come out on him and not on other players. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? At least it came up versus Iowa though. And those are some really good weapons that you saw him against. Castro, who's a top 20 player on my board, top 15 even. And then also Cooper DeGene, like and Xavier Nwankpa. That's an elite secondary to at least watch him against. So this is Tate versus Iowa. Um, it, I said he does a nice job coming back to the ball and sitting in a soft spot. Catching traffic versus Castro, and Castro ended up blowing up a bubble screen because, again, the guy in front of him just did not do a good job. Uh, he's not going to win the physical battle, so that's kind of indicative at 190 versus a heavy physical slot corner like Sebastian Castro. Uh, he has good route fakes, just not super effective at generating separation because his top speed is limited. Beautiful post with a corner fake. I think I ended up posting that one on my Twitter, so check that out. Uh, honestly, I see it with him. He's a very high IQ player. Strong hands with his catch and traffic, but then he ended up having two drops after that. So kind of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde in terms of his catch ability, which I guess makes sense. Contested catch grade was pretty solid. Would like for him to go a little bit faster into these 45 degree cuts because it shows great ability to cut um, the way he did on the post. He just has too much hesitation. Um, and again, I hate wasted movement. So this offense is weird. It does not utilize enough slants. It is honestly quite crazy. Slants are probably one of the most easy timing routes that you can do because it generates separation so damn well. Uh, by the way, we're in a tier jump. We're now in the guys who are flex. I do think this guy is that good. But um, this, yeah, I said that already. My God, Castro is good. Uh, nice outside release flashes, some upper body releases as well. Fourth down curl catching traffic first down. So he was kind of clutched that way. Overall, I am a fan. So really refined. And I think he's role specific for sure, but someone who I think can get open in short, short space and also get really good positioning versus press coverage. Uh, even though he didn't get a great versus press grade, if you have a really good release package, I think that can translate a lot better than the guys who have struggle versus press and do not have a good release package. But let's continue on. Torrey Horton's next. I love Torrey Horton. He's just kind of underwhelming as an athlete in terms of his top speed. And my God, we'll talk about, you'll hear me say this enough in my notes, but probably the worst guy, the worst route runner I've seen in terms of running a curl like the most uninspiring route runner I've ever seen in, in that regard. And it's the biggest discrepancy, I think, between those 45 degree cuts and those like 180s. But let's get in on this. Nice vision on a bubble screen. Not a super dynamic athlete. Nice adjustment to a poor screen ball. Made a guy miss to get positive yards. I also said, like I posted twice on my uh, Twitter about Tori with some all 22. And so check that out. But I said ankles fear this man. Like he makes dudes miss all the time. So awful sell on a curl leading to a pick six. So yeah, remember that one as well. This is versus Colorado. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, so that's, I think, a Shiloh Sanders pick six. Best play so far is a touchdown pass from him. Oh yeah, he ended up throwing a touchdown pass. Forgot about that. Um, touches have been solely on drag routes and screens. Finally had a little bit of twitch. Not top speed wise, but twitch. Has an inside and outside release package, but they're very rudimentary. Uh, willing blocker. 45 degree cuts have been very nice. He just not doesn't do hard cuts very well based on his overall attempts. A lot of false steps on his harder cuts. So he doesn't run them well. And then he also wastes movement when doing so. Um, he has near one missed tackle force per catch this game. Uh, nice get off. He's 45 degree cuts. So like he has a nice get off and 45 degree cuts are really solid. So I said he should be more of a slot slash run after the catch guy. Um, he has a nice job coming back to the ball as the QB rolled. So ended up manipulating his route that way. Uh, crap double move. I said this quarterback is a mother freaking psycho because he just YOLO'd a ball downfield to Tory. by the way. I remember seeing that. I was like, what in the hell? I saw some guys open as well, and he just like, he yeets that ball. He's a fun player to watch. Someone brought him up. And I'm like, yeah, that guy's fun. Uh, good catch in traffic. Pretty ass corner route. Ankles feared this man. There you go. Uh, bro runs the most ass curl routes I have ever seen. 
So Tori Horton, role specific, but I mean, there's a really big need for the role that Tori Horton plays um, in the short game. Maybe he's just not going to be the guy who's the deep threat. Noah Thomas is next. 6'6", 200 pounds, Texas A&M receiver. Uh, very intriguing. He is like, I think he's 55 or I think he might even be in the near the 60% range for contested catch overall his career, which is great. Uh, this is his game versus Alabama. And I actually, we'll, we'll combine LSU as well. Screw it. I didn't like how long my notes were versus Alabama. And I like Noah Thomas. So he's explosive and nimble for six foot six. He flips his hips very well. Top speed's capped, but he is explosive. Surprisingly, not as great versus the press so far. Again, just, I don't know what's up with these big guys who can't handle press. I wish he didn't try to stutter step or hesitate every time he cuts. Leans into the defender well for micro separation. Hence why he has that A there as well. Uh, he keeps calling for the ball and the QB ignores him. Another Max Johnson dig right there. I absolutely detested it. Um, but we'll just transition to the LSU notes because I think they flow well. He attempts to shift uh, his route when his QB scrambles. Talk about that route manipulation and that playmaking there. He makes guys miss in space, which was a surprise at that six foot six frame. Great adjustment for a low ball. I swear Max Johnson is so ass. I, that's a direct, I'm reading straight from this. Um, hung on through a big hit, so good catch in traffic. And I ended up being, uh, my notes ended off with him, with me saying, why is he so damn good after the catch? So um, really dynamic player, just not someone you're going to be sending deep, but he used the physicality well to always be open and which is a surprise versus press coverage. He doesn't do well, but if the guys are not just on his hip, he will use the physicality at the top of the route. Really do love that about him. I uh, wish he were a better blocker, but he's a little bit small for that 6'6 frame for that aspect. CJ Daniels is next. So I do have him above Kyron Lacey, but at the same time, this dude had above 60% contested catch rate, very role specific, but Liberty, he was absolute baller. So um, ended up saying Liberty to LSU transfer. Talk about an upgrade. Quite fluid, but he did get knocked off a route and he did not um, track a pass deep for a touchdown. He slept two tackles on one play. Not bad as a blocker, but and he's definitely will. No, I ended up not changing the color on the B minus. Damn it. There's uh, there's my one color mistake. No one cares. I care, but no one else does. Um, not bad as a blocker, and he's definitely willing to. Solid outside release. Capped, he ends up having a relatively capped top speed, so there wasn't as much separation, but um, he does have a nice high point for a sideline catch. So again, like kind of Johnny Wilson-esque with not great normal catches, but contested catches out of this world. Uh, did not use physicality to generate separation as much as I'd like. And to be honest, um, he has not had any since, um, he hasn't really had any separation since off coverage. Uh, he has a nice slant, which he uses to, uh, with great momentum. He flips his hips well, and he ends up maintaining momentum. Um, he had a shitty drop though, when he was on the run. Uh, top speed flashed on a seam, and he finally, so it finally got there. Uh, he got slowed down by press coverage. So again, grades are pretty indicative of that. Uh, great route change from a slant to a zig to get open for his QB that started rolling from early pressure. Do you remember that? Caden Salter got pressured early and he actually ended up, as he was running a slant, realized that, you know, I need to shift. And um, that's awesome. That's why he has a plus one there as well. Um, redeemed himself with a great slant and low catch from that drop earlier. He rounds his 90 degree cuts. Excellent outside release, and he had a nice short hitch. So overall, CJ Daniels, uh, I think he's actually going to work really damn well with Kyron Lacey. It's just going to be interesting seeing how, you know, uh, Nussmeyer adapts for not having that super high-end top speed. Both the guys have good top speed, but not Malik Neighbors and uh, Brian Thomas top speed. Alec Yuminor got a boost to his grade. I ended up watching more tape of him because it was another guy who I really, really liked and I still really, really like. This guy's a playmaker. I really do love his game, but I ended up watching extra tape of him versus Arizona and, you know, it is what it is. Uh, let's get into it. My guy needs to learn how to do a release package. Finally, it did have an inside release that he did do very nicely, but that was pretty much about it. Uh, he took good positioning, which is primarily why he ended up feasting on. I did not watch a Colorado game for his evaluation specifically because I knew he was going to be, he just absolutely cooked that game. 300 yards, ridiculous. This dude's an absolute free show, but let's get back to it. Uh, kind of nasty double move. Why is hard cut change of direction so well? 
curls, his overall hitches and curls have been really solid. He's a better route runner than I originally gave him credit for. Beautiful post, uh, post stop route. I remember that it was in the red zone. He fake, he like faked me out. He was just running the beautiful post and he stopped and sat perfectly in a zone, uh, zone spot. I don't know if that was planned, but it was like spot on. So I don't know if I give him just the credit for that. He still gets credit, but maybe the OC did a really good job knowing exactly what the defense would do. Maybe it was Alec. That's why I gave him a plus three for uh, his overall playmaking ability. Outside release is a major weakness, but the inside one displayed earlier was great. Hence why it's still adequate because I see the upside there. Uh, he gave up a little bit early because I don't think he thought the quarterback would throw a deep route. And so the, you know, the quarterback ended up throwing a missed ball because he kind of pulled up is what it is. It happens. Uh, he was running deep and he basically slowed down because I don't think he thought the quarterback was going to yeet it downfield. Quarterback yeeted it. But he has a nice run after a catch for a touchdown after selling a deep route. Um, and then he ended up having a stop route. So he ended up doing a little curl. Like he basically going up to stop really good sell on that. And then he curled up and made uh ran for a touchdown. So good for him. I really do love that. Like at that size, six, two, two, 10, uh, unbelievable upside for him. He has shown little physicality leading to press, getting the best of him most times until now where he ended up throwing a Ephesians price song. Uh, that was very exciting to see. And he ended up coming back to the ball and ended up making a play. So I do love that playmaking. Uh, if he gets more physical, I think that his separation is going to increase. And I think that overall, if he could develop the outside release the way he in develops the inside release, we might be seeing someone who could be a wide receiver one on a team in the NFL for 10, 15 years. Like he has that physical frame and he has those unique aspects that you're really looking for and someone that you want to hitch your wagon to. Uh, just right now, it's not there. And somebody who I really could see really going up. Um, F U T by the way, but they're going to have like a track team with bond and Matthew golden this year, like Matt golden, former university of Houston receiver there, um, with, uh, Samuel Brown, like he used to have a good squad, but Texas, what in the hell is going on, man? Like y'all are going to have some burners. So exciting for this one ended up watching this game versus Texas. So we'll talk about that game. Uh, one of his better games, but I said, my first line was zoom, zoom. Uh, smooth athlete. So smooth athlete and zoom, zoom, probably a good sign. Um, hits the brakes very well. So change of directions on point. Nice adjustment on a deep ball thrown behind for a touchdown. So I do remember that one. I remember watching Samuel Brown get open on that play. And then I saw the quarterback throw the ball and I was like, oh my, that was a bad ball. But it was Matt Golden who ended up catching it for a touchdown. Honestly, solid blocker. WTF for the size. Uh, ran a perfect post route. That was wide open, realized the QB bailed right, and then he adjusted his own route, but he ended up running into the defender. It happens. Um, so that kind of sucks. But uh, I said, oh my God, this guy is freaky. Nice job bringing the fade short into, uh, bringing the fade short into the body and got another touchdown. So like he's, um, he's somebody who I really do believe as a deep threat. I do love him, but the drop rate's absurdly high not mistaken it's like 11 or 12 percent for somebody who is like primarily a deep threat who gains that type of separation it is a little bit concerning and at six foot 195 i'd hope that he'd be a little more efficient but i think he's in that 30 percentile for contested catch as well so uh foundation is unbelievably there as like that type of route runner after the catch guy you're looking for uh get this dude on the drugs machine and you're getting yourself a super weapon i think texas is going to be absolute dynamite this year Tez Johnson's next, uh, part of the original video. So again, we'll keep it short versus Utah. Uh, ended up saying he has smooth slants, good catch in traffic. He's a willing blocker at 160 pounds. He's quite nasty. Um, he had nasty fake fade. Um, then he ended up transitioning it to a skinny post. So ended up basically faking the fade out and then cutting it for a skinny post. Did a beautiful job there. Good after the catch, but not really a contact uh, balance guy. Keep it short, keep it sweet. Good route runner, explosive good after the catch and actually Oregon and Washington both do a great job of having uh, blockers like develop. Like it was ridiculous how well Tez Johnson blocked. Uh, there's a video of it all out there uh, where he was, I basically said like a stick bug turns into a dog because he's just so small and he's like destroying DBs. So uh, one of the biggest surprise, honestly, there I could have given him a little bit more of a drop. Like could have done the minus four, but he plays so much larger than his size 
that I just wanted to knock him down a couple because of just being a little bit smaller. Continuing on, though, Ty Felton, Maryland. Uh, Ty Felton's a fun one. You know, a really good overall athlete, really quick hip flip, uh, you know, versus Ohio State as well. Key game for me to watch. He actually performed really well versus Michigan as well. But Ohio State is such a key game for me because those boundary corners, I think, like you see the Will Johnson tape, but I'm not I'm not saying the other corner that I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head. I'm not saying that he's a top 15 player in my class. I'm talking about two guys in Ohio State boundary corners that are top 15, like top 20 at the very least. So that's a little bit more translatable, but I digress. So he's a hard route. He's a hard runner, but he's not generating a ton of overall separation early on. Uh, very quick twitch on his 45 degree cuts. Very nice acceleration out of his release. He does curve his 90 degrees, 90 degree cuts. He did have a drop on a curl route, but he's very, excuse me, he's very smooth on his short curls. Eager to block. Overall, he'll be limited as a vertical threat, but he's a very solid route runner. He can use explosiveness to generate micro separation. So short and sweet for a tie, but you know, a six foot two, one eighty one. He's a little bit on the smaller side. Uh, doesn't really have that contested catch ability. Doesn't have the deep speed to be a pure deep threat. But um, he's going to be really good in short range, and I think he could end up being moved into the slot for that reason. And we'll see what happens with him. But you know, somebody where you know you have a lot of the intricacies to your game, but maybe not the foundation for greatness unless you're in the right role. Let's talk about Andrew Armstrong next, part of the original group. And um, let's talk about his game versus Alabama. He is smooth, smooth athlete. Has smooth slant with an explosive get off. Uh, he's a high end route runner, including his 180 degree cuts. He great job of carrying dudes after the catch for more yards. He's getting Brian Thomas vibes. Should have probably put that in there. <laughs> but uh, he's kind of more of a screen go. Uh, he's a screen go to guy. He's great after the catch. Top end speed is solid, but not unbelievable. Uh, refined route runner needs to work on his release package. He fought through contact and extended um, a play for a touchdown. Great catch in traffic. So uh, like really what knocks this guy down is the fact that, I mean, versus Alabama, he's playing against top end players. But when you're going up, when you can't separate versus press, and you're going up against NFL press coverage. There's a chance that you don't generate separation that you need to. And without that top end speed for Arkansas, you're just like it's too rudimentary and also they start honing in on him as a target so it's hard to generate separation when you're the focal point but great athletic profile um reliable hands apart from when you have to you know go up and get it but that's why he's so good after the catch why he's probably primarily a screen guy let's get to the top 10 we've already been recording for almost two fucking hours are you serious my god um colby young so he is a Miami transfer to Georgia and now with the Ra Ra Thomas news, who was going to be my 25th guy. I was supposed to be 58 players, but you know, Ra Ra Thomas got freaking arrested is what it is. He got released as well, but I uh, transferred to Georgia. Colby Young going to have a great, great time there, but he has a slow get off. I love his use of physicality at the top of the route to get separation. He's not a great route runner, but he does use strength very well. A uh, nice contact balance release has been solid so far as well. He's been mid as a blocker overall, slow 90 degree and 180 degree cuts, but that push at the top gets better separation than I care to admit. I would like to see a little more consistent effort overall. He had a great catch and traffic touchdown with a release, but he could, or whoops, release and tracking. So he tracks the ball very well. Uh, almost caught a great deep ball on Nate Wiggins with an inside release, but he couldn't survive the ground. Oh, that, that was pretty awesome to see his top end speed right there flash. Nice momentum carry on a slant and another broken tackle. Another great contested catch on a YOLO ball. Um, this one with great repositioning and a grab for the redemption. So that ball he dropped versus Wiggins ended up redeeming himself here. He almost rolls into high speed on certain reps because the top speed flashes. Quite impressed overall. He's going to be a beast. Bottom line. Just needs to get better in terms of his get off. But I'm very excited to see what he does there. Another guy with, I think he was up there in like the 60 plus percentile for the contested catch as well. If you're anywhere near that 60 plus percent, you're getting an A plus in that category. That's just not normal. But Luther Burden's at nine. Again, ruffle feathers is going to happen. It is what it is. I don't like his, uh, his consistency of effort. That's my thing. But I think his talent is through the roof. He's damn good at everything. And... He's not a contested catch guy on a consistent basis, but I've seen some plays where he was 
really damn solid at getting a one-handed catch. I'm pretty sure uh, it was versus LSU. He ended up, ended up having a really nice one-hand snag. So um, seeing that in my notes right here. But let's talk about the Georgia game because we talked about so many guys versus Georgia, and that's a really key game as well. Uh, nice job carrying a defender for extra yards. Uh, nice job gaining micro separation deep with a late acceleration and good ball tracking. He can get up there with his top speed. I wish he would go 100% every play. Might have a little top speed cap, but he is fluid and he has very solid acceleration. Does not really get separation with speed versus defensive backs because they end up catching up. Plus one for it factor because he has elite ball tracking. Uh, did not gain separation deep versus Kamari Lasseter, who ran a 4.65. Uh, nice route adjustment for a touchdown. Nice head fake on a Kamari pass breakup, though, due to a punch out. So he ended up gaining separation, but Kamari ended up bouncing back. Not going to lie, he has times where he's getting locked down. Definitely not a top 10 to 20 guy overall for me, but someone who I have a lot of faith in. So he's just somebody who I do like. There's not really someone you can really point to and say he's not good at. Like Even contested catch is adequate, especially for the role he'll play. So this is just a like straight line, balanced receiver. There's not much you can complain about. Uh, people have him as a top five player in the class. I'm not there. I don't see the physical upside for a top five player the way that we've seen it in other classes. I think it's key to reference other classes because we've seen top five talents. I don't think Luther adds up to it, but he's a damn good player. I'm not going to complain when a team takes him top 10, top 15, well, maybe top 10, I'll complain, but top 15, I won't complain. Like, He's a good player. There's nothing wrong with him. So very excited for that. I do think he's going to be a very good complimentary piece. I just don't think he's a wide receiver one. And that's okay. Sometimes guys aren't wide receiver ones. There's only 32 of them in the league. And some teams don't even have one. Some teams have two, but I digress. Uh, Travis Hunter is next as a wide receiver. Uh, he graded higher as a corner. So spoiler there. Let's talk about his game versus UCLA. He jogs a lot. Something I noticed about him as a corner as well. Um... Oh, man, did I freaking cover up the one minus the freaking Jaguar logo? I did. Oops. But who cares? It's like a minus one. So let's continue, though. He has curved out routes. Uh, a lot of his 90 degree cuts are just curved. But something I will say in here, um, we'll, we'll end up uh, saying it. But I said he's the best stop route runner I've ever seen, like hitches, curls, probably the best I've ever studied. So that's why he has a B plus there, because his ins and outs aren't necessarily good because he curves them and he doesn't maintain the momentum the way that Andre Anthony kind of did but those stop routes are jaw-dropping jaw-dropping but uh, nice curl stop route specialty arguably the best stop, stop route runner I have ever studied uh, not very noteworthy overall apart from the stop route he has nice acceleration but the top speed does not really gain him separation versus top end DBs uh, curves almost uh, curves, curves most of his routes, but he does maintain momentum. Uh, tough to decide between him as a receiver and defensive back solely due to that stop route ability. Otherwise, I think he belongs as a defensive back. So I actually, oh, that's why. Because my it factor, I ended up copying and pasting the dream fits from the corner video because I think he should be a DB. Um, but these are also teams that could probably use him as a receiver. Kind of works as a two for one. But super excited for Travis Hunter. I think he could gain a little bit more meat on his bones and use uh, some physicality, but uh, this I think he had like 67% on the contested catch. Like It's so funny because his ball production as a corner is dog, dog water. Like, it's not good. But in reality, it's fucking good. Antonio Gates Jr. is next. This is going to cause some pissed off people because this guy, minute, minute production. But he is a freaking baller. He is a baller. Um, this is his tape versus Michigan. I ended up studying. Uh, I, I'm going to be honest. I love this guy. As a UC, he's number seven overall. So again, keep that in mind when you're looking at like Luther Burden up there. Like this is someone who has very, very little experience. So I'm showing you the positive traits that I've seen, but it's not on a season long basis of starting reps. I don't know what the hell Michigan State is doing, but it is what it is. Uh, very little experience, but this is the most reps that he has and it's versus great talent. He has explosive quick feet. He has a very smooth and very polished release package. Uh, he ended up falling a few times on hard cuts, so balance might be a concern. Uh, his top speed is limited compared to the burners. Uh, he whiffs on blocks, but he does want to at least block. 
It is criminal that he's not their wide receiver one. Over, overall, very impressed. Can see him being a first round pick. Yes, I think a 0% drop rate or something in there. Like it's like 1% drop rate. But uh, you guys can see on my Twitter, I ended up posting quite a few clips of him. Uh, he is just ridiculous. There was no ability to see him run after the catch. So, you know, that's why he has a poor run after the catch grade. But this is somebody where I was looking, I'm like, dude, this is a starting receiver in the NFL. Just there's no production behind it. So um, maybe I'll look like a fool because he just won't continue to get reps. He probably won't even come out for this class. But, uh, you know, he's somebody that I have a ton of faith in. I don't know why he sucks at contested catch, but, you know, he gets separation like a mofo. And uh, that's because of the fact that he knows how to position himself and he knows how to cut hard. So continuing on to someone who has more tape, Jalen Royals ended up playing Iowa. So I was really excited to watch him versus again, Cooper DeGene, Xavier Nwankwa, Sebastian Castro. So week one, but he did not face any more real NFL caliber DBs over the season. He popped off as a blocker before he even saw his number. So I really like that. He's a feisty blocker. Um, he is also known as in the 60% club for the contested catch game. Uh, he, he fights for extra yards. He has solid curl routes. Um, he ended up, he got, he was the target on a free play deep. Wonder why it's maybe because he's like elite. I contested catches. Uh, he slipped a tackle well, and he got an extra couple of yards. I'm worried about his hands. Um, he double caught a curl, then dropped in the open field. So, you know, overall, it didn't seem like much of an issue, but I don't like double catches too much. I can see some hesitation route fakes, but I want more violent fakes. I didn't really feel like he sold it very well. He's definitely a run after the catch guy. He flashed some deep speed. Uh, he tries to modify the route, but he just hasn't fully gotten it down yet. So the foundation's there. Um, the catch, like catching, pretty much he's a deep threat who can run after the catch. Kind of like Tetro McMillan, but I think he's a little bit, <laughs> he's a little bit more role specific. Well, he's not Tetro McMillan. He's a deep threat that can catch, but he's also run after the catch. So uh, really solid balance there. And that's a couple roles that he's fulfilling. That's why I think he could be a really, really good contributor. Um, but I do think he needs to work as a route runner a little bit more. And I think he will. So TBD on that, TBD. Uh, Ricky White is next. I call him Mini Marv, Mini Marvin Harrison Jr. It's just sometimes when I get a vibe, I'm just going to stick with it. Like that's just the feel. Like when I was watching him, I just was like, okay, might as well. Um, he played against Michigan, which he played for Michigan State. So that was pretty fun. And he ended up cooking Michigan uh, like a couple years ago when he was a true freshman. Don't know what the hell Michigan State did. They could have Ricky White as well as Antonio Gates Jr. starting, but I don't know. I don't know what's up with them. But um, ended up watching him for Michigan as well as Kansas. I'll tell you about both because I really liked it. Uh, he has a quick curl. He's very smooth as a route runner. Would like a little more creativity after the route to get open. So I do think he sometimes can, you know, get lost in the sauce, so to speak. Uh, whoever the offensive coordinator is, is doing a shitty job because the plays suck. And Ricky seems to know it as well, given his like emphasis on some of the routes that just were completely shut down before the play even started. He ended up having a drop ball on a curl route. Um, he ended up being hurt or subbed out at the end of the game. So there's nothing on it. So I just continued looking at the Kansas game. Um, he ended up not catching a low ball. Uh, he's a willing but not great blocker. Uh, Def finally had some post route manipulation versus Kansas for some good sideline catches. He has flashes of leaning into the defender before the break and using separate or using leverage for separation. He's just not doing enough of it. Excellent sell on a double move uh, late. Or I said ended up having an excellent sell on a double move. Uh, there was a late throw by the quarterback and which ended up being a failed contested catch. Uh, another nasty double move ruined by poor quarterback play and over grabbiness by the DB. There was a PI called on the play though. Uh, unbelievably low center of gravity. So he shifts very well. Excellent tracking of the ball on a deep post for a touchdown through contact. I uh, kind of feel like I'm watching mini Marvin Harrison right now. Uh, still needs to work on shedding press big time. Oh my Lord, this quarterback is ass. There's number three uh, in terms of times mentioning that on this, but technically four, but two of them for Max Johnson. Human joystick on routes. I just want to see more of him after the catch. Can basically bail from his route once he's locked up, even though quarterback wants to target him, which is which I don't know if I am chill with, but at least he is not doing nothing. So he basically says, screw it. I'm done for. I'm bailing on this route. <laughs> and uh, if the quarterback targets the route where he's supposed to go, that's what I'm worried about. But 
Anyways, uh, he really needs to not be affected by press as much. It's painful to see how many opportunities slip by because of it. Uh, finally, a ball with some yards after the catch and a missed tackle force. This dumbass quarterback is going to get mini Marvin Harrison killed. Yeah, there's a lot of hospital balls. So uh, overall, I thought the ceiling was unbelievable for this guy. Unbelievable. If he can learn to get to deal with press coverage a little bit better, this guy is going to be absolute freaking dynamite. Isaiah Bond is next. Isaiah Bond's a beast. Um, didn't really have very many notes for him because everything can be summarized into a couple words. Burner, similar to Jamison Williams. And um, he ends up struggling with 90 degree cuts. That's pretty much his game. He's pretty much fluid everything else. So, um, you know, I really do like his game. He ended up having some, like his hard cuts are better than what I initially described because versus Georgia, I watched uh, him dice up Malachi Starks, who's a really good coverage corner or well, corner slash safety. So uh, I do think Isaiah Bond brings the heat. He's unbelievably fast. He brings a ton of Jameson Williams to the table. Super good at flipping his hips on 45 degree cuts and not bad after the catch. So uh, really big win there. Dion Burks, again, we're going to try to keep these ones that we've already talked about shorter. Dude just has an unbelievable drop rate and that's what kills him. But great center of gravity. One of the few guys to give Will Johnson uh, some trouble, but Will Johnson still absolute dynamite. But he transferred from Purdue to Oklahoma. Uh, patented Purdue bend out route. Yeah, they, they just, I don't know what the hell they're doing. Like that's something where I know the program just does not tell their guys to do their out routes sharply. It's just part of the timing. Uh, he's a good athlete, great hard cuts and solid explosiveness on his 45 degree cuts. Slowed down in the honey hole for, for um, extension of time for uh, for where he was open because quarterback didn't do it right away. Probably the best wide receiver in the class. <laughs> That's not true anymore. Uh, great adjustment to an overthrow on a five yard out. He can easily adjust 90 yard cuts with everything else I have seen. So the rounded outs, I didn't think were going to be something that was in limitation on his behalf. Uh, good catch in traffic, carried a guy for some extra yards, great recovery on a messed up play. Flash of Cordell Patterson, but much better as an overall receiver. Um, a lot more opportunities to get production and did not get targeted. Touchdown on a great float, uh, on a great floated pass. Okay. And uh, he ended up tracking the fade perfectly. So I uh, really do love Deion Burks. If he ends up catching the ball better, this dude's an absolute dynamite machine. Now let's talk about Bo Collins. Bo, um, this dude's a monster. So he he's kind of a little bit Jekyll and Hyde overall. If you look at like you get some A pluses in there, get an F here and there, F and C. But let's talk about him. He's a feisty blocker, excellent outside release, a little top speed limited, but not bad acceleration. Uh, what a blocker! Wow, excellent motor. Oh my lord, this guy has a great release package. Uh, and he's crazy high motor. Some of the best releases off the line I have seen from a collegiate receiver in a long time. Bro runs a full speed, even on runs. So again, big, big plus for his overall, um, his overall motor. And, uh, yeah, it's something I just, I love that about him. That's a great foundation, not super strong 45 degree cuts, but there was no coverage on him at the time. Oh my Lord. This guy may have the 10 for a release. So all time great for release. It is insane. He did get the 10. I have felt strongly. I did not see that ever from a receiver. Um, great catch in traffic while being hit sticked. Sharp cuts uh, have been respectable, but not elite, but they have been solid. So there you go. That's what the B minus is for. Um, he's doing fairly well versus my number two overall player. Ended up posting that on my Twitter. Uh, so that is saying something. A couple catch and traffic drops, one of them leading to an interception. Getting better at 45 degree cuts, but he leans early indicating the cut. Flashes some deep speed, but it's nothing crazy. Dude bench pressed Ben Morrison. One issue I have with him is concentration drops because he had a solid 40 yard game if he could haul in the catch and traffic slash contested catch. Bro just diced Kyrie, rest in peace. So rest in peace, my guy. Um, not Kyrie, <laughs> I'm so tripping. Not Kyrie, uh, Cam Hart. Uh, I'm going to try so hard not to give him a plus five. I have never seen someone with such a high motor. I am genuinely so impressed. So yeah, he, he's a really fun guy. Shout out to Bo Collins. Jaden Higgins is my number one player in the class. Just kidding. Number one receiver. <laughs> if I were a player at this position, um, physical dynamic, just nothing wrong with him. I mean, he's going to be, he's going to be fun. He's going to be fun. Uh, also forgot to recolor top 100 to orange, but we ball. Uh, this is versus Iowa. Let's watch how he faces loaded defensive back course. Uh, he creams them, but still solid hesitation on a quit. Uh, but still, he had a solid hesitation on a quick out route. 
Smooth slant route uh, has a nice cut up field as well. Poor positioning on a contested catch touchdown drop. So that's something I didn't really like about him. It was like that one play. He ended up basically letting the defender stay inside his frame rather than, you know, repositioning, getting in front. The Samuel Brown move, I call it. Um, no, the Colby Young move. My bad. Well, one of them went to the U, one of them transferred from the U. I digress. But uh, he's a really solid blocker, unbelievably smooth as a slant runner. Um, number eight did a great job stopping another nice uh, smooth slant. So shout out to number eight on Iowa. Um, it could have been a bit smoother, but crazy sharp double move that uh, I could I would expect from a small slot, not someone of his stature. Very nice usage of leaning in and using that as leverage to push off and separate, plus nice quick hands. Uh, almost did a push-pull release, which is very interesting. It, it was like almost like I was watching Defender there. as kind of nuts, but I digress. He is extremely fluid. An another catch in traffic through contract... <laughs> Through contact. English is so hard. I mean, I'm three hours, I'm two and a half hours in, but we ball. Uh, nice ball tracking for a touchdown. I still want him to learn positioning, uh, to learn to position himself in front of the defender, not behind or beside them. Uh, not great versus press within five yards, but if it is after, he is unbelievably killer. I, for some reason, got some Laporta vibes with his route running. So um, this guy's special to me. You don't, he doesn't, he moves differently than anybody I've really seen at 6'4", 210, in terms of the fluidity and the efficiency. Like, he's built like a rock, and he moves, like, he floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee type of guy. And I think that's special. Like, he's not going to be the jaw-dropping athlete, but for that frame, he really could be a number one receiver, and I think that's special. He's just under a wide receiver one for me. If you guys remember, this is that wide receiver two tier. Uh, I think he's barely under it but i think he can get there honestly super huge fan of this game thank you so much for watching i love y'all so much i i just baited putting this into three videos but i said fuck it let's do it into one because you love me and i love you um you maybe can give me some help by going out for that underdog code but i digress love y'all see you on the far side peace